like like we I my opinion is that um, uh, more music and art is needed on this planet. Music and art is like an anti antidote to mm -hmm. war, to to uh, to anything negative, because mm -hmm. music and art are are creative. Yeah. It, this creative impulse uh, and is an is native state to every individual. Mm. And if you see an individual battered down, not enjoying life, it means it's submerged somewhere. And so, just play them some music. Just <laughs> help, help it, help it come up. So I encourage people uh, in any generation to enter into the arts in, a, mm. in any way they want to, either to become a performer or, or whatever they whatever they want to do, or, or to become a participant, even to go and listen to music, mm. or, or to participate in their community somehow in, in the arts, because it brings a community up. Yeah. I mean, the, or a family up. It brings it up. The more art there is within a group, I think, make, makes it easier to think positive thoughts. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to ideas of conflict, then maybe you've got enough free spirit to think of resolving it with communication rather than bombs. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well said. So, so. <sighs> All right. Hey everybody. Hey everybody. How's it going? This is a uh, welcome to our electric bang hang tribute to the man, to Chick. And for us, uh, this is a family uh, reunion of sorts to celebrate uh, the maestro. You know, we had, as you saw, so many wonderful moments. And we are here to share some of them with you and take your questions later and uh, just have uh, a nice time talking about our friend that we miss dearly. And uh, yeah, guys, you want to say hello? Hey, everybody. Hi, everybody. Everybody, hey, everybody. Everybody's here. So, you know, the, uh, the, the band actually started out as a trio with John and I, and I figured it might be kind of cool, we figured it might be kind of cool to just uh, one at a time give our stories to, um, to y'all, just to listen to how we were so fortunate to get involved with Chick in the first place, to meet him, and of course to share all and learn so much from him and share all the music that we've shared over the years. And um, I think John, in the in the lineage of meeting Chick and getting the band together, I think that John was the first one that actually met Chick and got the gig, from what I understand. So, John, you can clarify that and uh, and tell us all about your story, um, meeting the maestro and how the, how the whole gig happened for you. Yeah, thanks, Dave. It's great to see you guys, Eric and Frank and Dave. It's um. It's a family, this is. And so for me, the family journey kind of, interestingly enough, uh, began with Gail Moran, his wife, the great, wonderful Gail, wonderful, beautiful, mu incredible musician and person. Um, my early 20s, I, my first, actually, I went on the road with Gap Mangione. I was 19, my first road gig. And then later I got to know Chuck, his brother, and Chuck invited me in the early 80s to his house for a jam session and Gail was playing piano. And she um, she went home and uh, told Chick about this little Italian guy that she heard that she thought was good. Uh, and and yeah, <laughs> so then, good. The next, next thing is I remember playing at a book signing for Tony Cohan, a friend of his, who wrote a lot of books, and they were both involved uh, in the same faith and uh, together in Scientology. I guess they were uh, so. You know, I was at this book signing and I was playing a duo. Jimmy Haslip got me this gig, actually. They wanted acoustic bass and tenor sax. So I was there and I met Chick briefly, but that was before all that. So they used to have these beautiful Valentine's Day parties at the Love Castle, the house that they had, the beautiful house on uh, in Los Feliz. And I remember the first time going there, I was playing with Victor Feldman's trio. So there I was. She, Gail had told Chick about me, and now I'm, in, now I'm in his living room playing with Victor Feldman, <laughs> kind of freaking out, because I've been trying to get the gig somehow and talking to Joe Farrell. I was playing with Joe Farrell, the saxophone player, and asking him, does he have auditions? He goes, no, he doesn't have auditions. I said, well, am I ever going to you know, have a shot at this? It was a dream of mine. And then uh, he heard me in his living room, and then you know, one thing led to another, and he asked for, he said he was going to put together this electric thing, 
and do I play electric bass as well? And I said, yeah, I started on that. And then one thing led to another. And um, uh, the funniest thing about it was he called first and said, oh, I've been listening to your stuff. Sounds really good. We talked for a while. And then he said goodbye. And I thought, OK, well, I guess he liked it, but not, not quite enough. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, he calls and goes, man, uh, you know, though, actually, I was at a studio at Weddington Studios and, and uh, Wally Grant, a very funny engineer who was very sarcastic. We were doing these gospel records and I'm sitting in the in the lounge and uh, all of a sudden the in intercom goes and Wally goes, uh, hey, Patatucci, it's Chick Corea on the phone. Answer the phone. I'm like, yeah, thanks, Wally. Go ahead. Take a <laughs> hike. You know, then he, then he does it again. Then he does it again. And I'm like, come on, Wally, really? You're really breaking my chops here. But he and then the third time he goes, you idiot, pick up the phone. It's really him. And I'm like, oh no! So I pick up the phone and I'm like, "Hi!" And uh, Chick is like, "Yeah, you know, this is the funny part to me because he was such. He is a hero and was a hero." So he goes, "Yeah, I know you're busy doing a lot of recording sessions and busy around LA, but would you consider joining my band?" <laughs> I wanted to leap through the phone and go, "Yeah." Oh, wow. <laughs> but um, so it was kind of magical Cinderella time for me. So um, yeah. I'll let you pick it up from. From there, brother. Yeah. I just I want to say one thing before I go. Rusty Edwards, who's a very long time friend of Chicks, he knows him forever. He said he sent me this quote today to share with you guys, and I think it kind of encapsulates how a lot of people are feeling. And thank you to all the people who've been reaching out to us. We haven't been able to get back to everybody, but it says my grief is like a broken rib. It doesn't ache so much that I can't move anymore, but if you touch it, it hurts, and it still hurts terribly, uh, mm -hmm. and it might never go away. Uh, so we're, we're going to honor Chick and, and I know he want, would want us to celebrate him. Yeah. So. Yeah. Go Beautiful, Dave. John. Yeah, man. Beautiful, well, John. yeah, it's, I, I, I'm not, John, do you remember when that happened? Like what month of, cause it had to be 84, right? Sometime. In, yes. In yes. I think, 84? I think it was before Valentine's day. Well, around must've been a, after Valentine's day in 84. I'm well, not sure early. how it all worked. It actually, that might have been the first Valentine's Day. Then I was there the next year. And I think I got hired after right. Valentine's Day in 1985. Well, right. That makes more cool. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so that was I, the second time I was there. Right. So uh, that was important because the lineage of how this all happened and when it happened. We I don't know if we ever discussed this, the timing of everything. But because I was now playing with Bill Connors and Tom Kennedy at the bottom line in New York, right? And this would have been, this would have been uh, late, I think late 84 or very early 85 and somewhere around there. And I don't remember the month, but, um, but yeah, we did the show uh, or we're doing the show. We're like playing the first tune, right? With Bill Connors and we're on the bottom line. I don't, I don't know if anybody remembers it or knows the club, but it was this huge stage sure. in the back of the room. And then there was, you know, the, the tables right in front. Then there was this big aisle in the middle of the club. Then there was another whole section, you know, the row of the club back there in the back. So I'm playing, we're playing, and you could, you know, you could see everybody walk in. And sure enough, we're playing, and it was unmistakably, here comes Chick walking into the club with Gail. And I was like, oh, man. And I've told this story before. I'm sure people have heard it. But I'm playing, and I... And I was in disbelief, and, and I must have hit something wrong. In those days, I used to put this ride cymbal and the floor tom on the same stand. And I must have hit it with my knee or something. The whole thing went falling over in the middle of the tune. Yeah. yeah, so I was like, oh, crap, you know. So I had the, you know, somebody came running to help me put it back up, and, and I'm playing. Okay, so we get done with the set. I and, that. Uh, yeah, we finally <laughs> get done with the set and Chick comes back after stage, after the show. And that was my first experience with meeting him. And of course, you know, a little backstory for me, I, you know, I think it was 1976, um, uh, growing up in St. Louis, I went, I was always going to see any show that came through. And back then it was mostly big bands. It was the, you know, Stan Kenton would come through, Peter um, uh, Maynard Ferguson, which I think is who I was seeing then, Buddy Rich, all the big bands would come through at a few different venues. And, and at the time I had just met uh, Tom Kennedy and his brother Ray great piano player that also passed away too soon. Um, but we were in the parking lot and Ray says, hey man, listen to this. You, you know, and so he puts on, I believe it was Humpty Dumpty. Um, 
on on which leprechaun maybe matt matt hatter. Matt, hatter. Record. matt hatter right matt hatter record and of course i had never heard anything like that it was you know so it was gad first time i had heard steve and, and it was just uh, so that became a quest for me to get everything chick everything gad and and listen so i i grew up you know trying to play to those records and just listening and listening and listening to chick and his phrasings and all the all the stuff so i kind of you know felt like i knew he was playing anyway so now back to the show he comes backstage hey sound great do you want to you know i found this uh this Patitanichi, I didn't know what the name was, this bass player. No idea, right? And he goes, yeah, I, uh, you know this guy? I said, no, I never heard of him. He said, well, he's a great He's great kid, Italian. Right? Great. Yeah, yeah, right. So he said, you know, would you, same kind of deal. I mean, it was right there on the spot, though. It was like, yeah, yeah. I'm putting this electric thing together. You want to, how do you feel about coming out? And I was like, hmm, let me think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, it was just a, a, it was a moment in time that was so special because it was a huge dream. So got the gig. But the reason, how it came together for me from what I was told was that, you know, Chick was in New York with the night off, um, or a few nights off, actually, with Gail. They were hanging out and um, they were visiting, uh, they were visiting everybody. They ran into Michael Brecker and he, Chick was asking, who's the young drummer in town? And my name came up. Then he's hanging with Tanya Maria, and he's listening to a Michelle Camillo record, and she's like, what do you think of this piano player? And he goes, yeah, he's great, but who's the drummer? Mm -hmm. Second time the name comes up. And then Gail happens to be looking into Village Voice and sees my name again in, in at the bottom line. So that's how they got to the club. And then, um, yeah, sort of the rest is history after that. So that was my, my you know, introduction, uh, you know, um, audition for for the band and uh, and then we started hitting in april of 85 right john that was the yeah that was the month Spring. that we were do you remember how how much we rehearsed that first gig for that alario's gig i just remember um because you know i didn't know dave i had heard about dave i think for, at one person that knew him in la that was david garfield said yeah there's oh yeah guy from st louis you know? That's right. He was a St. Louis. He's and, a St. Uh, Louis guy. Because, yeah. Um, yeah, he said you got to check this guy out. And I said, okay. Um, where does he live? He goes in New York. And I said, ah, oh, far out. But I didn't, I didn't know. You know. So, all of a sudden, it was in the in the spring, and we were rehearsing at like SIR or Leeds or one of those kind of places. And basically, Dave came in the room. We shook hands. We started blowing. You know, it was like we started right blowing away. chick. And it was like, wow, this feels really good. And and Chick was starting to just, he was throwing out all this new music. And a lot of the stuff didn't even have, I mean, Rumble was called Sequence 8 at that point. <laughs> I don't even yeah. know what, what some of the other ones were called, but... Um, yeah. And it's funny, the other day on that, on that call with Bernie, uh, that, uh, that I think it was with Steve Bailey, or was it the one with... Yeah, maybe yes, we really, yes. they played a little bit of the Ilarios thing, and it sounded funny to me because it was us kind of finding our way through match, trying to yeah, figure very out very slowly. To do it. it was the slowest match ever. <laughs> it was the slowest match ever, and we're, I, I, I can hear myself fumbling around trying to figure out what kind of feel am I going to play on this, and, and um, it's re it was really interesting but exciting. Oh my God, he kept bringing all this music, and we were just like, wow, this is yeah. this is a dream come true. Well, I just remember the rehearsals weren't that that long. I, I know it, it couldn't have been more than I don't know three or four days or a week maximum. You know that we that we spent. And well, because you and I were doing studio work, so we were sight <clears throat> right. readers. We were already sight readers, and then of course the next. Right. I mean the next. I mean uh, later on, we we encountered one of the sight readers of Doom in uh, our yeah. particular saxophone player in this picture right here. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, so we hit that gig as a trio <clears throat> and yeah. you know and that was like you know the gig we were still basically learning the music rehearsing like you said and they recorded that thing so that's what's out there is you know, that Alario's gig and then we proceeded to tour right and we proceeded to tour the rest of that year um or did we do the record first no we were the record we, was at we, the end of the year i think or something but you know what remember, remember that remember the, the the queen mary gig i have to say Miles oh, yeah. was there with his band, right? So we're all. That's right. Out. I was at that one too. Really? Uh, you were watching. So that was just trio, I think. Still. Yes. Yeah. So we're blowing. Chick goes into Miles's trailer, and uh, Miles is like, 
I want the music. He wanted music for All Love. All oh, right. You know that tune, All Love, and maybe one other tune. He asked for the music for, so he liked it. So Chick yeah. finally said, Miles, what do you think? He said, sounds like eight guys. <laughs> <laughs> so he was i you know we were excited because it was like wow miles liked it you know or, you know we were I just wonder, like, I, you know. I wonder if that was a pro vibe i'm not sure if that's positive or well negative. yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I don't know but uh he did ask for the music so i think he, he something he liked who knows right well anyway we so we toured the states right we did yep. and there's some pbs stuff out there um you know on on just the trio and we it's we were we had some great times and we learning, you know, the music and just, you know, that was uh, that was really cool. And then we did the record, I think, you know, at the at the beginning of the next year, because when, in 86, we started touring with a guitar. Guitar entered the band. Scott Henderson got into the band and we did a tour with that. Oops. Right. And that was after that was <laughs> sorry, Frank. It's another guitar player. It's okay. He didn't last. No, you got okay. the gig, so don't worry. Um, but <laughs> but uh, so oh, so we did that gig. We did all that touring, and then uh, it, so the first record was made, um, and we toured that really successful record. Got all over the place, and then it became time to uh, expand the band. And but what about for, Carlos Rios too? He was on the record. Well, Carlos was great on the record, job. right? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Carlos um, was was there, and that was just an amazing experience doing that record. And 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 actually, John, I was going to clarify. You, you mentioned Bernie. That's Bernie Kirsch, the the engineer, yeah. um, friend of Chicks for forty five years. That was there in the beginning and through all the records with us, all a lot of the touring with us as well. So. Um, you know, that was that. So anyway, it, it came time and you guys can pick this one up for, for Frankie because I wasn't, I was still living in New York at the time. So I didn't get to play for the auditions. I believe it was Tom Breckline, right? Yeah, that's right. It, correct, yeah. So enter Frank Gumbali onto the scene. And I think, I think maybe John, you, you, you gotta, you gotta chime in on this cause you tell a great story of, of, of the audition process for Frank and the, <laughs> <laughs> I hear it was well, quite a funny, I'll tell funny the story up, up to the audition point. Yes, do, yeah, yeah. Ahead, Frank. Let's hear it. You know, there's a bit of history there, too, for me. You know, with Chick, um, I remember hearing his music when I was 13. And, you know, as a kid in Australia, um, all my friends were listening to completely other kinds of music. And I was going down this way. And uh, I remember hearing him of the Seventh Galaxy. That record mm. literally blew my mind. But it was Chick I was listening to. I was trying to transcribe all his crazy, amazing solos. I mean, he just captured my heart, Chick did, from the very first time I heard him. And then I was like you, Dave. I had to go out and buy everything he'd ever done. And I did, and I listened. And, um, you know, I even saw some of his gigs in Australia. I mean, it was very rare that a group, uh, I remember Chick brought a big band, that band The Return of Forever with the horns and the strings. And Gail was playing keyboards in that band. And I saw that show in Sydney and it blew my mind. It was just uh, incredible. Dave Liebman was on saxophone. Hmm. So I was, you know, I was getting the spirit, you know. I just went, you know, I've got to go to L.A. I'm going to go where all my favorite music is coming from. And, you know, not long after I was in L.A., I got there in 82, and, you know, working away, plugging away, teaching and playing, doing gigs. I already had a couple of albums out before I met Chick. But the thing is, you know, I heard about an audition. And, uh, and it was really fortuitous because I happened to be recording <clears throat> an album at Mad Hatter. And I was in awe, you know, I was looking at all the you know, the original artwork for Romantic Warrior and all this leprechaun uh, Leprechaun in the in glass, you know, and like beautiful covers, the original artwork and stuff like that. So, you know, and I knew many of my favorite records had been recorded in that very studio. So it was kind of, you know, it was a very an emotional feeling being in that room. Well, the cool thing was, you know, I've told this story a lot too, but the cool thing was the chicks' offices were below, you know, uh, that studio. It was a two-story building in L.A., and, you know, I happened to be packing my gear in the car one afternoon uh, after one of the sessions there. And a woman came out of the office. I didn't know who she was. And I just went, 
what have I got to lose? You know, I'm, I'm going to go up and I'm going to give her my card. And I gave her my card and she looks at it and she went, yeah, Frank and Bali, I've heard of you. My husband's played with you. Well, this was <laughs> Evelyn Brechtline, Tommy Brechtline's lovely wife. Right. And, um, and she's Ron Moss's personal assistant, you know, Chick's, Chick's manager's assistant. Well, you know, short story, you know, uh, six months later, I get one of the calls to audition. And, uh, and I remember being so excited, I could hardly contain myself. I was jumping about the room. And, uh, <laughs> you know, because I'll, I'll tell you back up a little bit, too, because you mentioned that gig uh, at the Queen Mary. Well, I was in the audience, and I'd already bought the C It was my first CD, was that electric band record. And yeah. it scared the life out of me, too, because I remember putting it on, and I had the volume way up. And, you know, I was used to <laughs> needles in the groove, you know, on an LP, and it came on so loud, <laughs> I jumped. And it was such a great sounding record. Wow. And anyway, I was, I was enamored by that music, and I would always love Chick's music, so it was great to hear that record. It was fantastic. And uh, so I went to see the show when you guys played. Uh, I thought it was the Long Beach Jazz Festival. I think it must have been after that, though. After the record, the record, the record was... came out. Yeah, it was after the record came out. Or maybe it was before. No, I'm not quite before. sure of the chronology there. But in any case, I'll never forget going to see you guys live as a trio. You know, I was sitting there going, holy crap, you know, I'm seeing chicks surrounded by keyboards and, and playing insanely good. Um, and then you, John, blasting your solos and holding it down and just the, the consummate bass player. And then, you know, Dave's drums knocked me out too. I mean, I'd never heard a drum sound like this. It, they were so powerful. And I found out later that the reason was, I mean, Dave was one, the first cat to really hand the uh, audio engineers a stereo mix of everything. Everything was, you know, like as guitar players, bass players, you know, we, we have our gear, we have amps, we have our stuff, we tweak and we really get into the sounds. And most drummers just show up and, and hope for the best with a couple of mics and a bit of reverb on the snare maybe, but not Dave. He had samples and a, a mixer and stereo full range speakers, but the sound coming out was just insane. So I thought, man, this is uh, an amazing band. And I thought, the only thing they need is a good guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> I got the guitar player for you. Uh, so I thought, you know, great band, need a good guitar player. So. A tad biased there, of course, but, you know, and then I uh, got the call for the audition, and I was so excited. I think, you know, enthusiasm is one of the most important things as a musician, you know, and I was so psyched that I sent Chick's office FedEx. The next day after I'd heard, I'd sent, you know, LP, cassette, videotapes, uh, bio, photos, you know, there was a giant pack that went boom on their desk the next day. <laughs> you know, and so they probably went, wow, this guy's keen. <laughs> He's rather eager. <laughs> you know, Some boy, did, boy, did. yeah, whatever. You know, it was really an exciting thing for me. So the good thing was I'd already played with John. In fact, I invited John to play on one of my albums, uh, the album uh, A Present for the Future. And Coincidentally, it was a tune called Legends, which I dedicated to Chick. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you remember that, John, but you played wow. beautifully on that. Yeah, you'll have to go back and listen to that one. Um, so I'd played with John, and I'd also played with Tom Breckline, who was yes. the drummer for the audition, because Dave was still living in New York, and everybody else was on the West Coast in L.A. So, um, you know... It was great that I had that familiarity with you guys because, you know, meeting Chick was, a, a, you know, to me was a big deal, you know, mm -hmm. to anyone. And hey, Frank, uh, so Frankie, he, did you get the did you get the music? Did you get the music beforehand? Any of it? Or did you just I'm walk telling in? you, man, the thing was <laughs> that the instructions were immensely vague. Uh, <laughs> I got uh, Chick, Chick's office said, uh, just learn a couple of his standards and um, Maybe have a listen to something, maybe, maybe rumble. 
on, on the electric band record. So, uh, but, you know, Chick even said, uh, don't, don't worry with the tune, just, just come and blow on the C minor or whatever it was. I think it's C minor. And I thought to myself, what the hell? I, I don't need to learn C minor. I think I know that one. So, <laughs> so I went, I'm going to learn the whole tune, you know. So I remember Chick looking at me when we were about to play the tune. He says, so, should we take it from the middle bit? You can just blow on the C minor. I said, hell no, let's take it from the top. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, take it from the top. <laughs> I love that tune. It's still one of my favorite electric band tunes. It's so much fun to play that tune. And so uh, I don't know if I played it perfectly, but I, I really uh, played it the best I could at the time. I, I think I got it mostly right. Enter and there's, 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 a, there's a part in that tune that's really backwards rhythmically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a bending. And if, you, uh, and if you're not on it can be a complete mess. And, uh, and I, luckily I'd been studying music and, you know, I was pretty, uh, pretty aware of backward rhythms. And that one was really hairy to play it first time right, you know. So uh, I think that's what got me the gig, just playing that bit right. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I think it was, I would think it was match. Uh, I mean, that was for you. That was impressive. Uh, that was impressive that you came in. I mean, there were a lot of good guitar players that came in, uh, wonderful, and they were scared to death, every one of them, I'm sure. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, that's, that's hard music for any sure. guitarist. I don't care who you are, right? Yeah. So, yeah. and some played well. But uh, Frank came in, and I think he wanted it more than anybody and he he was ready to blast i mean it was so i remember uh him playing really well i think you you pretty much nailed rumble actually and then we played got a match and this was a thing i'll never forget in my life <laughs> breckline and i were laughing because you know it's up there and it's burning and but frank not only played the melody great with with all kind of passion but then the solo came all right and chicks blowing and then it's frank's turn over to you. And, uh, you know, I had been experiencing with Dave, like, you know, that whole thing, the first part of the band where there was just the three of us. Every time Chick was finished with the solo, it was mine, and it was terrifying. You know, it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, oh, go ahead. You got it. You, you know? followed him every so, night. <laughs> but Frank was like, he was not to be denied. He came in roaring, and I remember we were playing. He was burning, and Chick <laughs> and Tommy and I were just laughing because he was, he was just going. And it was like mm -hmm. he was playing as if it was the last solo on earth. It was. He was I going to die like it was the last time the solo on earth. Well, the thing is, I have to it tell you great. a little bit. Thank you, John. <laughs> right from the horse's mouth because you were there. The, uh, the thing that happened after, though, was a bit puzzling to me because after I played that tune, Chick got off the keyboard and come over. He came and shook my hand. And I went, whoa, <laughs> hey. <laughs> I mean, that, that feels good. And then he said, um, your amp is going to be pointing sort of a, an, at an angle across the stage. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, did I already get the gig? This is <laughs> what? <laughs> and, and then, John, you said, uh, Chick, we still have one more guy to audition, you know. <laughs> and so I left the rehearsal place uh, after that, and I didn't hear anything for a whole week. I remember uh, I was living in an apartment and I was coming home from teaching one afternoon, kind of dejected because I thought, oh, man, maybe someone else got it. You know, I, I cool, you know, at least I got to play with him once. And, uh, and I remember this was the day when we had answering machines on tape, mm -hmm. right? So I'm, I'm hearing Chick talking on my answering machine while I'm trying to open the door. I got bags and guitar and shit. I'm trying to get the door open and I get in and I pick up the phone and click. I went, damn. So I'm furiously rewinding the cassette going, what did he say? What did he say? And it's just small talk. He says, oh, hi, Chick. I mean, hi, Frank. This is Chick. Eh. Well, gee, you're not there. Look, uh, look, I'm just getting on a flight. I'm in LA. I'm going to New York. Um, I'll give you a call when I get there. I mean, <sighs> man, I have to wait another six and a half hours till he gets to New York or more. So everybody in the call again, go away. You know, unless <laughs> it wasn't tickets. Go away. 
Don't call me. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, six and a half, seven hours later, I get a call. It's Chick. And I'm going, you know, it was just small talk. It was driving me insane. So, Chick, how are you? How was the flight? Oh, it was kind of bumpy, but, you know, we got here. You know, any flight you can walk away from is a good one. And, um, you know, and then he's... And I went, chick, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> did I get the gig or did I not get the gig? <laughs> and he was shocked. He said, oh, really? Nobody called you? I said, no, I've been waiting on the phone with bated breath, you know, and nobody said a peep. <laughs> and he said, oh, man, I'm so sorry. Yes, of course, I want you to join the band, blah, blah, yada, yada, yada. And that was that. But, geez, for a minute there, I thought, oh, well, there's somebody else. <laughs> hey, hey Frank, I, mean, I have to say history. <laughs> I have to interject something because um, you know you uh, you still have that effect on us when every time we play match in your solo, <laughs> I'm personally <laughs> laughing because you're it's just burning, man. It's like it's comedy. It's so good and like Tsunami. crazy. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Anyway, well, so you, you know have that effect. You make, you make people very happy and laugh when you play your solos. Oh, so. I, I, right, every time we, we play, <laughs> with every solo, you know, Frank, no matter how great his solo was, you know, um, you know, we'd go back to the dressing room and and, uh, and John would, you know, we'd, we'd all be like, Frank, that was the most amazing guitar solo I've ever heard in my life. And, and John would say, yeah, man, you almost got up to your audition level. <laughs> uh, but you know why that kept happening because first there was chick and then there was john and then there's eric and they're all just crazy solos amazing solos i go what the heck am i gonna do so you know it was all your fault basically. <laughs> it's like sink or swim you know just get up there and blow otherwise you know following right. all the cats and then dave <laughs> the duet with dave and and chick every night was just yeah, was extraordinary so much you know fun. Wow, so much fun. unbelievable yeah, you so... guys were psychically connected you know and so um, frankie then how how long did we tour as a as a quartet then Cause it was well, uh, did, or did we did we well, do yeah, that we did. alone yeah because yeah I'm, we did I'm we alone. had a uh, one tour as a quartet the thing was when i got the audition and i got the gig uh, you know, I'd put so much effort into learning one or two songs. I went, oh, no, what have I done? Now I have to learn all the rest <laughs> and play them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was uh, a great challenge. The first tour was a U.S. tour. Mm -hmm. And you guys were in uh, Europe. No, no, in Asia somewhere. So, uh, they, you know, but you'd come oh, back right. and uh, I, I had a, I joined the band and we went, I think the first gig was in Allentown, Pennsylvania. It was a wow. nice, quiet place to start because, you know, not only did I have to be, you know, in the band as an unknown, really, I was relatively unknown at that point. And having to play after Alan Holdsworth opened for us every night. So I'm going, ah, I had to go on after Alan and play with all you guys. Guys, it was uh, quite a challenge, and you know, again, it was like sink or swim, and um, I, I was m highly motivated. You know. So, what period of? Do you remember the period of time that this? Yes, was? it was. Remember? I got the gig in October of 1986. Right. Okay. And soon after, we uh, we did a, a fall tour around the U.S. We did about 30 concerts, and it, after Allentown, I think two days later we played New York. So that was, you know, that was heavy right there for me, you know, being a kid, just in in the fire basically. Was that was that, at, was that at the bottom line by any chance? Again, did it, did, is that mm. where we played? Mm. You know? I don't remember. No, I think it was uh, at that. Uh, what's that place on the Upper West Side? The the concert hall. Oh, the played the Avery Beacon. Fisher. I think no, no. Beacon. The Beacon. Beacon. Oh, the Beacon. That sounds right. I'm pretty right. sure we played the Beacon, yep. and then we went yep. up the East Coast. But we ended up in L.A., and the last show was uh, at the Palace in, in Hollywood, and that was pretty cool. It was yeah, a great right. tour. So then after, <clears throat> after that amazing touring, and we had the winter off, but I think it was early 87, right, that we started to, to get the next record happening. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, Eric, is this enter... 
enter your scene or what's the uh, it's your turn buddy what's what happened here yeah it was right it must have been very early in uh, 87 right but uh yeah i mean i had been a uh like you know like you guys i mean i've been a major chicory fan um you know my whole you know since i started getting into this music you know and um i remember i had a band a quartet um uh, in high school, and we play, you know, some of the early Return to Forever, early Return to Forever, you know, um, you know, a lot of the feather, feather tunes. But we even we transcribed the entire Where Have I Known You Before record, and I was trying to play the Aldemiola lines, you know, on um, wow. saxophone. Yeah, try. Uh, <laughs> a word there. Um, but in those years, it had to have. Yeah, it, late 86, maybe. Because I remember I did that Palace gig, too. So that was part of that first tour of mine, I think. Um, but uh, anyway, back then, I was, you know, I've told the story a lot and, and embarrassingly, but uh, not so much. I was playing in the Disneyland band. I, have you know, went to years of therapy to be able to say in public that I did. <laughs> <Disneyland>. <laughs> but, uh, but it was, you know, you know, for, you know, all kidding aside, it was a serious, you know, five, it was a gig, five days a week, benefits, and the whole nine yards, yeah. you know. Um, but uh, where, most, <laughs> yeah, where most, uh, you know, most guys, that was kind of all they did. I, I played a, um, every Monday night, I played this little club near the baked potato called One for LA, you know, just south, on the same block, just south of, uh, of the baked potato. And um, uh, I had played uh, a Chick first heard me uh, a year before at a festival that I played with a, a mutual friend, John Novello, and his band. They played, I think it was in D.C. or somewhere, and, and I guess Chick had heard me there. And then, um, but and then with that band, we were playing every Monday night at that club. And uh, so the story goes, Chick had decided that he wanted to add a horn to the electric band, and uh, and I, you know. That you know, talk about wearing out a record. I mean, me and my friend Mike uh, Labrador used to, you know, wear that first electric band record out. I mean, you know, it mm -hmm. just, you know, definitely knew every note of that, you know, every beat of that record. And so, um, so anyway, uh, so the story goes. John can corroborate this. Um, uh, Chick, you know, mentioned to you know the guys, you know, who might be somebody he was suggesting. John suggested me, and. Um, so, and somehow Chick knew that I was playing in this club. And there was this little teeny Hollywood hole in the wall. If you could squeeze 25 people in this room, you are shoulder to shoulder, you know. And, mm -hmm. and um, there was this one Monday night and, and um, you know, you could, from the stage, you could see the front door. And my wife, Leanne, happened to come that night and, you know, she's sitting right in front and we're playing away. And the, the door opens and in walks this entourage of five or six people. <laughs> and I, I'm playing, and I'm looking. And I'm looking and I'm playing. I'm going, man. And this one guy walks in and he's got these iconic round glasses on. I'm thinking, no, nah. no, nah. because I had no idea. You know, I'm just playing a gig, you know. <laughs> and there's Chick Korea, you know. And I, I was like, bah. <laughs> <laughs> and so he comes in and sits down. And he knew John. John Novella was a friend of his. That was part of it, too. And uh, so not only, you know, he and you know, the whole group's down and, and they listened to the first set and, and uh, we played two sets and he came up and sat in on the second set. And then uh, I'm just like shaking in my boots. You know, I had no idea that he was there to hear me play. God, you know, thank God I didn't know that he was like kind of auditioning me, you know, <laughs> I would have like forgotten, you know, which hand to put on top of the horn. And um, <laughs> so, uh, we, you know, John asked him, so what do you want to play? And he says, how about 500 miles high? And I remember thinking, man, thank God I went to Berkeley and learned my standards <laughs> and do that tune. Because yeah. if I said, you know, oh, sorry, man, I don't know that tune. How about F Blues, you know? Uh, <laughs> that would have been, been next. So he, he um, we played and, you know, um, and afterwards, you know, we were talking. He was very complimentary and so gracious and fantastic as he always was. And so next day, go back to Disneyland, you know, and this is again, end of 86, beginning of 87, and you know, no cell phones, you know, just uh, one phone in the band room. And I'm um, telling all the guys about what happened the night before. And we happen to be on a break and the band room phone rings. And um, 
uh, the, the tuba player goes and <laughs> answers the phone and uh, he's talking and everybody's kind of, you know, blabbing away in the room and he looks at me and says, uh, um, uh, Eric, the phone's for you. And I'm, I'm walking, you know, and I, he, I said, who is it? He goes, he, well, he said it's Chick Corea's manager. And, and suddenly the room just like, you know, as if like the volume was just turned off in the room and everybody was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> never saw 18 guys, you know, stop their conversation. And I, and I go and I say, hey, man, you know, how did you get this number? <laughs> you know, here I was Leanne. So I never for, I'm forgiven uh, Leanne uh, for when uh, Ron called uh, the house, you know, for me, she said, oh, no, uh, Ron, he's not... Uh, He's not here. He works in the Disneyland band. Here's the number, you know. <laughs> no, don't tell him that I work at Disneyland. What are you doing? <laughs> so anyway, he says uh, that, you know, Chick really, you know, loved the way he played last night. And they're, uh, the band's in the middle of the Light Years record. And he wants to uh, join the band, join the record. And, and um, once the record's done, they can start a tour. You know, the first tour is in South America, I believe. And, and uh, you know, what do you think, you know? And so I'm just, you know, what am I going to say? Yeah, oh, gee, I don't know, man. Well, you know, how much of the pay, you know? <laughs> well, you got a lot of work with the Disneyland band. I yeah, mean, man. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. That's a whole other story, actually. But um, so I, uh, so at this point, everybody's like, you know, huddled around the phone, like, what? What are they saying? What are they saying? What's going on? <laughs> and so I, I put the phone down. And I, uh, I can't use the uh, the hand gesture that I used in public, but uh, you know, I turned around to everybody jokingly, but you know. And I said, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> so then, so then I, you know, I, I, you know, get the gig, talk to chick, go to Matt Hatter, play, you know, uh, my stuff on, on light years. And it was fantastic. And so now it's time to rehearse for the first tour. Right. So he gives me a pile of music. All right. And so it was all the charts from light years. It was parts from uh, the first record that you guys were playing that, that he had written. Um, well, he had sort of indicated where I would be playing. And then there was a pile of charts that we might do. Right. Mm -hmm. So I had about, a, uh, uh, he gave me a, it was about 30 charts and not just like 30, you know, like standards, 30 Chick Korea compositions. Right. You know, and, um, and so in the rehearsal mm -hmm. was in about a month, you know, the rehearsals for the tour. And, oh. you know, I was not, you know, cause, you know, here is in this band, you know, Frank Gambale, Dave Weckl, John Petitucci, and Chick Corea. You know, I'm not going to walk into this, you know, rehearsal and, like, not be prepared. So I spent a month, you know, memorizing, not just learning, but memorizing. And the charts didn't, weren't transposed. They were all just, you know, concert parts. Right? In that stack of music, there was one chart. It was a chart that Chick had written for the 1983 Return to Forever re uh, um, reunion tour called Overture. Right. So and it was this huge, long, you know, epic, you know, ch epic chart. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, but I thought, oh, well, this must have been him thrown in here by mistake because it's a Return to Forever chart. You know, all the rest are electric band and his, you know, iconic thing. So so I put that aside. I spent eight <laughs> hours a day, you know, for a month. I got to that rehearsal and I was like, man, these guys are going to be so impressed. I'm not even going to I'm not even going to open the, the thing. Of music, you know? <laughs> I think uh, Bernie or somebody yeah. said, do you need a music stand? I said, nope. No music stand. No, I'm good. Thank you. You know, and uh, <laughs> so I'm ready to get our sound together. Start the rehearsal, and Chick goes, "Okay, so let's start with overture." <laughs> Classic. <laughs> I said, "No." <laughs> and, I'll teach and you. So, yeah. So I'm like, no. I, I get the envelope of music and pull out this, you know, like ten page chart. Yeah. I'm like, you know. And I've, I've never sight transposed better in my life. I got to say, like you know, you know, <laughs> don't you dare make a mistake. You know, so you know, the ultimate Murphy's law. But one one last funny story about my first gig with the band. The first gig we had with the band was in Minneapolis, right? My my first U.S. tour, and um, so we do the gig, and it's at Symphony Hall, right? And uh, great gig. I'm nervous as hell. You know, I mean, you know. What you know? What can you say? Obviously, and uh, so, but it was it went fine. Great, you know, great gig and all. So the next morning, you know, before we had to leave, uh, you know, I, I went for a walk, and I'm I'm out for a walk, and and um, the guy stops me on the street. He says, "Hey, did did you play with the electric band with Chick Corea last night?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Man, 
that was incredible. And I said, thanks. He goes, no, no, I got to tell you, you're one of the most amazing musicians I've ever heard in my entire life. And I said, oh, thank you so much. You don't know how much this means to me. I mean, I, you know, it was my first gig. I was, I was really nervous. And man, thank you so much. He goes, no, that was incredible. By the way, what kind of bass was that you were playing? <laughs> <laughs> And I said, <laughs> I said uh, no, I'm, I'm the sax player. And he goes, oh, oh, you were good too. <laughs> <laughs> that happened to me a lot too, Eric, believe it or not. People yeah. thought, oh, that's a great guitar solo on such and such a tune. I said, you numbskull, that was a bass. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell the difference? <laughs> that's funny. But yeah. I, so, I, I got to say, though, about Eric, though, man, there were some times where Chick Chick brought in, you know, and this is a real, you know, we're used to reading and stuff, but he'd bring in like one of those massive things and, and Eric would sight transpose it. Unbelievable. Playing it. And, uh, you know, it was all we could do to just sight, you know, we were sight reading well, but I mean, it's another story to take one of those things that Chick wrote and and just deal with it. I can say that if that overture thing had happened to me, I would have been dead. I think most people would have been even in the key it was in. <laughs> well, we, we all we all know, we all know the joke, Frank. Of how do you get a guitar player to yeah, play I know you. So, <laughs> um, a chart in front of me. Um, well, I'll tell you what. It's kind of a lesson, actually, for all of the young musicians maybe watching, if there are. Um, that this, I, I got to say. I mean, you this band, these guys. I've never seen any group of musicians prepare so well for things. Like if we were going to do a record, everybody was kind of like um, unspoken. You know, we we were all knowing that we didn't want to be the one unprepared, right? So, you know, we, we all came into the sessions like really having yeah. done our homework. And I think, it, you know, put, being put into a situation like that that was such a high level... Um, you know, coming from Chick and and the music that he composed uh, was I think really that's hard. because we had such a love and reverence for Chick. Of course, that, yeah. You know, when right. he when he would call and talk, and I, I would get so excited about the prospect yeah, of yeah. playing his music on a record. I mean, you know, how right. exciting is that? How how big a dream do you want to dream? You know, right. And it's for me, uh, you know, of course you show up prepared. Well, one, I wasn't the greatest sight reader. I could get music off the paper, but I, I had to learn it as best I could before. And, and Chick's music, too, often uh, people don't really know this so much, is that, you know, Chick, I remember the, uh, the Inside Out album, for example. Mm. That, he wrote that whole album in about a week. Yeah, well, yeah he was composing... Crazy, yeah. he and was not composing only that, while we were doing right, it, actually. we would record one tune during the day, and he'd go off after a full day and just write for the next day. You know, I mean, it was, it was. Wasn't, uh, that, the, wasn't that the Tale of Daring record? Yes. Yes. Oh my God. Totally. <laughs> well, for those of you that don't know, Tale of Daring was this. Uh, it was very daring, and it was a tale. It was. It was a an epic piece you know this thing i think the song itself was what 10 minutes long or something like that mm -hmm. it was yeah it was a it was just this epic piece and it, to record it and we and basically we were sight reading if i if i remember correctly because we didn't this was in that record right where we weren't right. getting the music ahead of time actually and, i think that one we got a little earlier because i remember getting a cassette of a demo we got demo but, yeah. Well, I'll well, tell you what. I still remember me I, as if I was sitting in the studio, you know, yesterday. I had the music in front yeah. of the drums. Yes. You know, I, there's pictures of it somewhere. <laughs> I don't. I couldn't find them. I was looking. I but... had my brother Nuncio, who was visiting at the time, and I said, "Look, you take the first page, start walking," and <laughs> it was like 32 pages long, and there's very little in the way of repetition on that song. It's almost through composed. There is a theme, of course, but my right. goodness, you yeah. know, I remember just going, I'll never learn this in a million years. But anyway, what I was, what I was, Go ahead, what I was getting at for the kids and the, you know, the learning aspect was, you know, I mean, of course we all studied hard to be, you know, uh, to be able to get the gig in the first place, 
But it was really a, you know, it kind of was a template for the way that I think, at least I can speak for myself, and I know every time I hire Eric to do something, because um, I've used you a lot, man, for different projects, I've, it's a, you're the consummate professional, and I think that's the way we all approach things, is that we, you know, we're, we're, we try to get prepared, and, and, uh, and you're right, Frank, it was in that, in that essence, it was all about the love for Chick of the respect, you know, it's like, man, respect, we want to get, we want to get this together and nail this, and, but it was a, and, it was a, and it's, it was a good lesson too. going forward. Say again? And, and please him, too. You Absolutely. Know? Well, a lot, of the times, a lot of the times what cracked me up, it was he was the one that was like, wait a minute, let me look at that. And he was uh, to get, yeah, his, to was get his own music. He would, he would yeah. write stuff and he would forget how to play it. <laughs> I used to you love know? how he gave us very little direction, actually. Yeah. I remember going up to him in the early days. Uh, he was surrounded by keyboards and programming and guys just <laughs> swooning around him, fixing things and, at rehearsal. And I had a question about one of the charts, you know, he, he never put anything beyond a seventh on a chord. He would like C7, B flat seven. And me as a geeky, you know, nerdy, I want to know more about the harmony, man. Well, what are you thinking? You know, I went over to him and said, Chick, tell me this C7, do you mean like a, a sharp nine, you know, flat 13, or you mean like a natural 13, like diminished dominant kind of thing? He says, do you see all these keyboards here, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't be here if I didn't think you could figure it out or handle it yourself. <laughs> and that's the last time I ever asked him a question about the chart because he said, man, look what I'm dealing with over here. You know, it's like the keyboards, <laughs> 10 keyboards at once and programming sounds so like, okay, great, cool, thank you. Just thought I'd ask. Well, Frank, yeah. you have the, uh, the, the, uh, the honorable distinction of having been the person who saved Dave Weckl's life. That's true. Oh yeah. Oh my That's, gosh. Yeah. Come on. True story. Gotta tell the in story. Our many, yeah, in our many, in our many touring escapades, and uh, we were we were in Naples, right, Frank? We were in the Grand Old Napoli, you yeah, know. Man. And uh, there was this guy, a, a lighting guy, and there were these giant uh, lighting stands that were on this funky. They were made of steel, very heavy tripod kind of a thing you know and we were rehearsing it was the afternoon sound check rehearsal and we're playing pretty loud and it's beefy and there's this guy each of these lighting poles had about i don't know about 20 lights in a double stack you know and these and, were in the corner corner front of the stage basically yeah, on right? each yeah. side of the stage not in far a from tent. my, in my a rack tent. In a tent. we were in a tent that was the night Pino Daniele sat in with us. It was a great night. One of them, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, so look, you know, out of the corner of my eye, I see the guy fall about 12, 15 feet, bam, onto the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Although, Sorry, it sounded concerned. like this because we were blasting, right? I couldn't hear anything, but I saw the guy fall. And then what freaked me out was that the whole tower started to fall in our direction. And it did one of these on my rack. And I called out to Dave because, you know, I don't know, he was looking at Chick or something. I said, Dave! <laughs> and he, Dave managed to get up off the drums Are the, you mo dumb? the moment. The yeah, I was, I was like here and I, and I was just like this. And all of a sudden this thing Smashed. was right where I was. Where oh, I was God. Standing. It would have just, whoo, <clears throat> that would have completely, been horrible. I had to find a hi-hat stand and do the gig because it completely broke the hi-hat stand. and the head i think i had to change but man, yeah, we would have was... had to find a drummer you know, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah forget that <laughs> thank you frankie thank you Your for now look you know for, geez yeah that was that, that was, was scary right though that 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 was really frightening it just goes to show you the th things that can happen on a stage you know right you got to be careful right. all the time keep your eyes peeled yeah that chick had a chick had an interesting thing remember john he was uh oh he was, man he was, i think i think before the guys but we were we, we were playing and i was playing a drum solo and you guys were back behind the curtain right yeah behind we were the... back and it was black you know you couldn't right. see and um i see him and we're walking towards each other and all of a sudden he whoosh, he's gone it was like a magic <laughs> trick but i was like wait a minute he's gone uh, i i kind of freaked out because he disappeared and I, I went running i knew something was wrong and he had fallen there, somebody had 
left a space between the risers. Right. And he fell, you know, and uh, um, I was yeah. really worried. He, he wound up pulling through just fine, but uh, he, he hurt himself a little bit that night. But uh, he, we kept playing, I think. He, he just, right. you know. But it Who was very the stage out. I mean, come on. Yeah, right, but, exactly. but Dave, Dave was blowing. He didn't even know what was going on. No oh, idea. that he played was an drum incredible solo. drum solo. Oh, and, and Chick and I were like, "Yeah, this is really cool." We're walking towards each other. <laughs> oh, my God! Right. Uh, yeah. Kind of like the ballet dancer um, when we did uh, the was it the Greek on yeah. the Holder tour, and Los we Angeles, had yeah. the ballet dancers. John, you were talking about that story where. Uh, uh, was a bit Elizabeth of a Moss, remember? A young Elizabeth Moss who oh, was yeah. Ron's daughter. Now she's a huge star. We love her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We loved yeah. her then too. She was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And she was very prepared, right? right? She danced like a pro that day, that night. Mm -hmm. Great yeah. theater. She's a little, a young mm -hmm. girl killing. Mm -hmm. But then I'll, t I'll, I'll let you tell the other part, Eric. Well, you've, you've got it better because it was, she wasn't alone. There was another ballet dancer do you know doing the part right. they were, they were right. dancing to eternal child i think it was right yeah, yeah. The whole, you know dance thing there like, was a video you know. of uh, eternal child that had that featured those two yes dances. right yeah so elizabeth yeah. Was, elizabeth is flawless but the older dancer fell not just fell <laughs> yeah she really I mean, fell. and she thank god she didn't get hurt or anything but it happened so fast we were just like oh no <laughs> it, was, it was just but the poor thing, I mean, she fell yeah. with a major thud. And, and yeah. that, that tune wasn't loud, you know, so we were playing acoustically. And yeah. you feel this, bam. And, and once we once we realized that she was okay, you started cracking up. I like, had my had head down. down. I was hitting the <laughs> acoustic bass. I had was, my head down. <laughs> and I was buried. And I was kind of shaking. Oh, yeah. Because cause here it was, like, little Elizabeth just nailed it. Like, she was perfect. Yeah, yeah. And I have another song. I had a rough time, and uh, we felt bad for her. But once we knew she was all right, it, w it was comical. But at first, it was like it was yeah, a little it shocking. Was it was shocking because I mean, I, the Greek theater stage is not soft. No, and it's slippery apparently. Yeah, well, I remember another story too. Uh, an electric piece of electric band banter. You know, sometimes it, it used to shock me that people hadn't even some people hadn't heard of Chick Corea. I went. Wow, where are they being under a rock or something, you know? And uh, we'd show up to these hotels, and the uh, the receptionists go, "Y'all with the band?" And we go, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And we'd often say, you know, "Yeah, we're with Chick Corea." And they go, "Who? Huh? Chickory? Chick? Wow!" <laughs> so we got tired of saying that, and after a while, I remember showing up to a hotel, and okay, I was going to try something else, and they said, "Y'all with the band?" And I say. Yeah, yeah. Where would Led Zeppelin? <laughs> and the woman would say, "Yeah, which one are you, Led?" <laughs> <laughs> so, so you couldn't win for losing there. Uh, so which you know, one like, which one are you? Well, we Led? had we had so many, so many <laughs> great kind of the amount of touring we did. I mean. I, I, I don't remember. I, I remember actually I, I had to move to L.A. actually to be off the road because we were touring so much. We had, yeah. there, there was, it was just a, a period of time in life, man, where it was just awesome. We were always it was seeing the world with this great, great guy and this, you know, mm -hmm. this amazing music. It was, uh, you know, to still to go back and look at a lot of the a lot of the footage these days of, uh, you know, yesteryear is uh, still still got to pinch myself, you know, at times. We, we too. were so young. When I when I look at those videos, we looked like kids. Yeah, we kind of were. Yeah. We kind of were, yeah. But, uh, but, you know, Frank, what you said before was it was really uh, something, and, and Chick was always about this, and, and he, uh, you know, and he said it in the opening video, which, by the way, we've got to give a little kudos to Steve Workin, who was uh, behind the scenes helping us uh, yeah, Steve. put this on. Thank he you, put Steve. together that He put together that whole intro, and, um, you know, so thank you, Mr. Orkin, for that. And uh, But Chick, you know, he was always about the creativity, the freedom, the to be free to create. And that's that's the one of the things that he he as a, I I try to learn as a eventually becoming a leader sometimes was to was to give the freedom to to create and uh, but I don't think anybody was as good at it as he was he was uh, he would he would 
analyze things and you know and he had an idea of what he wanted but he had a way of of doing it and you know and coming to us with it that was such a positive you know it was almost was. positive re positive reinforcement at the same time that it was you know saying hey you could probably do this better you know check this out or try this but you know but the the freedom when we were recording especially and there was never kind of any direction you know to say ah eh, try you should don't play that play this you know mm -hmm. unless it was a specific comp thing or a, you know whatever it might I be i have but, to uh, i have to tell you something that i remember from one of the recording sessions too go and go. um yeah. it was again from the inside out uh record and um and actually, Ed Chick told me often this was his favorite solo of mine in the electric band repertoire was a song called Make a Wish. Hmm. And I remember I, that was really hard. The changes were crazy. And I just went, screw this. I'm just going to go for it, you know. Um, caution to the wind. And the solo I was really happy with, except for the little bit at the end. I just didn't feel like I came out of it right. And so I went into the console room and a chick sitting there listening to it, really digging it. The band sounded amazing. The recording sounded amazing. And I said, Chick, can I, can I go in and just fix that little, little bit on the end? You know, it, it just wasn't quite right. And he looks at me, he says, Absolutely not. I'm not changing <laughs> anything. I love it. It's perfect. I said, but it's but it's not quite right. I made a mistake at the end. He says, Frank, if you didn't like it, why did you play it? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I had absolutely no answer for that. I wasn't expecting that girl. Well, why did I play it? You know, I had to go contemplate that for hours. <laughs> oh, that that was like on the um, uh, inside out. Eye of the beholder, eye of the beholder record, I think. Because light years, and you know, you guys can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but light years was was sort of Chick's idea of doing kind of a I don't want to say commercial record, but a, a record that he thought might be you know like a real universally um, you know big you know popular jazz record, right? And so he very unlike him you know from up till that time and and never again after it was kind of a produced record you know i mentioned when i got the i got the gig i went in and did my parts and so it was all kind of overdubbed and, and nobody knows this more than than dave because he you know in the recording and the mix process you know dave was kind of in charge of the, of the night shift is that right when you guys yeah, I mean, Chick was kind and he was kind enough to give me an, an associate production credit on that record, which I'm not sure was deserved. But, but yeah, we were. I involved my buddy and partner on my stuff, Jay Oliver, on my records, and yeah, we were we were in shifts. We were working 24 hours a day to mix light years. And you're right, the way that we that we recorded that record was almost in a pop mentality. You know, even on Light Years, the title track. I did the drums, you know, kind of separately. I played the I played the kick, snare, and hi hat and overheads first, and then I overdubbed the toms. I was like, you know, oh yeah. Look back well, you go back and like, listen to that record, and son, it's a great record in every respect. But sonically, that record is unbelievable. I mean, it just sounds mm -hmm. so huge and great and rich and luscious and and great. And from what I gather, I don't know if I ever really talk to him directly about this but i you know i i know that chick didn't enjoy that process of well put it this way from then on in from then on out he he wanted to make sure that we played everything just live you know right, like, right. Cool. so and i kind of didn't really know that and and so so we got into light years and the first i forget what tune it was that we recorded um you know at the beginning of the first session but after we did it we you know, got to take what we like. I went up to um, Chick and said, "Hey, Chick, would it be okay if um, you know I took another crack at that solo?" You know, and he said, "Well, no." <laughs> and I, it happened to you too. That's good. I'm glad to hear this. And I, and I, I said, "Please." He said, "Well," no. <laughs> and, and he said, "Well, no," because you know what, what you played had what 
you know, had everything to do with what I played. And what I played had everything to do with what Frank and Dave and John played. And it's a conversation. And so you, you replace one part of the conversation and, and it doesn't make sense. And, you know, I, th- I said, yeah, okay, but can I redo my solo? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was, you know, and, and that taught me such a huge lesson. I mean, of all the lessons we learned of playing with Chick for all these years, um, it, is that, you know, there's, it's not a soloist versus band. It, it's, it's a constant conversation with everybody in the, in the band, you know. And even like on, on gigs, you know, if we, if, you know, I was a horn player, so I, when I wasn't playing, I'd be standing there. So he, he'd want, you know, Frank and I, if we weren't involved in the music, to kind of go off the side and whatever was being played, you know, just let that sort of be featured and then come back in when you're playing. But when we're, we're all playing, it was always a conversation. And the cool thing for anybody who's, you know, who's seen videos or been to those gigs, Chick was always looking at us, you know, or whoever he's playing with. You know, it wasn't, he, could, he wasn't just kind of had his eyes closed. And even when he was soloing, it was like, it was always like he was telling a story or asking a question or eliciting, eliciting, eliciting a response of some sort. And, you know, and it was just, and, and from then on, I think, you know, I certainly learned that, oh man, this is what improvisation is about. And, and you know, jazz music is a, music in general, you know, not just jazz music, but it's a constant communication. And he was just so giving with that. I was, I was so, uh, you know, I was so intimidated when I, when I first got this gig, I got to tell you guys, I'm sure I've had in the past, but I was really scared. I thought, man, I, I'm not good enough for this. You know, you got to be out of your mind. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I got it. And you guys were so wonderful too, but here's Chick Korea, And he was just so like, like the ultimate, best friend father figure that's like man you know go for it the more you experiment do different things the more it, it was like you know the way he responded in his comping and his playing it was like yeah man awesome go go you know create do your thing you know and it was just it turned one of the most potentially intimidating situations into the most encouraging situation and you know ah, just, yeah one thing i remember about chick too i mean there's so many great things. He, he, he was the, a master and we all loved him. But the thing is, I remember thinking, you know, people would come to the shows and they'd see one night, they'd see one performance and Chick was always blasting, you know, he was always on. I, I don't think I ever heard him make an error in 36 years. And so, but the thing that used to amaze me was hearing him night after night after night after night after night. The depth and the what, what I would consider the very essence of what the word improvisation means. It, it means to have no preconceived idea of what you're going to play at all. And Chick always approached his instrument with that sentiment when I would hear him night after night. You could tell it was Chick, but my goodness, it was always fresh. I mean, I don't know where, you know, that essence is something that I really loved about Chick. I could listen to him night after night and he'd always make me want to go and stretch and take my playing where I hadn't gone before either, you know? That was the essence of Chick for me, you know? So you guys can run with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. you know, it's there was a lot of the music um, where, you know, of course, being in the drummer role, you know, we're, you know, us drummers, we're always supporting you guys, you know, for your solos. Right? So, <laughs> uh, Sometimes, whatever. Man, so, whatever. Yeah, whatever. I know. <laughs> um, but you know, there was Chick would write a lot of of music where it was, um, you know, if I got a if I got a solo, he would he, a lot of times he'd want to play with me, and it was like you said, Eric, it was like a dialogue always, you know, communication, and you know the uh, <clears throat> there was there was two two songs that that stuck out for me that were so special, and and one of them was Tale of Daring, where we had that huge drum and piano, mm. um, you know, yeah. duet, which by the way on the record was. That was a, in, to my recollection, was just a, a first take thing that we did, and it was totally improvised and you know no planning. So, 
Um, and that's that's part of what you guys are talking about about not redoing the solos. You know, it's like us us drummers. We back then, especially when you're talking about 24 inch tape and you have to get the the, the razor blade out to do edits. You know, it was like there mm-hmm. was no fixing or overdubs basically, unless Bernie would punch the whole band in or something. But mm-hmm. I very rarely remember that happening, unless we just all clammed something. You know, as a band and we needed to keep the take but fix the ending. Whatever it didn't happen that often. But uh, but that one and of course match and the the thing the thing that was and again that I learned from and just appreciated and was so cool every time it happened was that that dialogue that 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 sense of being being there in that moment that was uh, it, it, it's it's that moment it'll never happen again you know and that's that's mm-hmm. what Chick thrived on you know he he thrived on on that communication and he thrived on the dialogue and the interaction and it was the joy that's what made it the joy of making the music you know that was so I, that was so I think, special i think he enjoyed the seat of the pants kind of thing you know mm-hmm. like the, yeah. the being on the edge because yeah. as i recall those electric band records i always thought man why didn't we record these after we'd done a world tour where the tunes were so we did do that on well, the first record yeah we did it on the first <laughs> record but i'll tell you why i'll tell you why we didn't because do it for and, me it's always sounded like yeah i'm still learning this song right. yet we're recording it I, why but, don't we come you know, back in a year and do it then you know right. i always back, felt that you know but back then we you know the they were under contract with grp and you know so we had to deliver the records in fact um i don't know if you guys know um frank and, and eric but you know, the reason the acoustic band ever happened was because the electric band couldn't deliver a record in time because oh. we were on the road. Mm-hmm. And GRP was saying, we need a record, we need a record. And Chick's like, I, you know, it was, I don't remember which tour it was, but it was it was oh. after one of the, might have been after um, Inside Out, or I'm not sure, whichever one. I don't, I can't remember the lineage of the records, the, the sequence, but but the acoustic band record happened because we couldn't do a record in time, you know, and right. it happened to be the first one that we won the Grammy for, John, you know, back that's then. Right. But, but yeah, it was, um, that's why we yeah. couldn't do that. That's frankly, interesting. Because, that's interesting. Yeah. I never knew yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, the other thing you guys were talking about, about the incredible um, communication. I mean, I spent like all all of us, you know, I spent and plus in the trio too with Dave. I spent the last thirty six years looking across the stage and in into his eyes. We we're looking at each other the whole time, <laughs> basically. And then something, you know, obviously I'd look over Dave, but but the harmonic and the rhythmic information that was being sort of transmitted. Uh, I'll never forget the first time when I got in the band. You know, I'd been playing with people, and I thought, oh, I can improvise over changes, and I feel pretty good about that. Mm-hmm. until the first rehearsal uh then you know you got all these tunes and his tunes are harmonically very deep and they don't go necessarily in uh, the easiest places so he starts blowing and it sounds like the greatest thing you've ever heard then it's your turn and you're looking at the changes and they only say c7 meanwhile it's got a plus 11 and a flat nine and you know it's this over this and he had a different way of doing it his thing was if you want that kind of thing write the voicing that was his philosophy. We talked about it a lot. And basically what I wound up doing was whenever he would come in with a new tune, I'd go around and finally go, okay, please play your play play the the changes. changes. And yeah. I would write down all the alterations. And he yeah, didn't right. like that I did it, but I had to. Yeah. Because I knew what I was hearing. And I was hearing, I mean, I was hearing those, but sometimes it, they were coming so fast that I wanted to at least have a little heads up. So I was, yeah. So he, cool. he started comping the very first time I remember playing a solo in one of those rehearsals after he played and reinvented the universe in his solo. And then it's my turn. And I'm like looking at these things and I'm like, wow, when he played, it sounded like F blues real easy. Now it's like a a minefield. I'm getting blown up. And his (laughs) comping is like Muhammad Ali in the ring. And it's like, bam, boom, boom, bam. And it's rhythmically (laughs) so powerful. And I feel like I'm just getting blown out of the room. And also I feel like, you know, I got to learn how to have more rhythmic power when I play so that when I play a phrase, I mean what I say and it sticks. That's what he did for all of us. You could not halfway mean a phrase. Mm-mm. The comp would just blow it out to sea. You know, like <laughs> you, you mean that and it's going to stick and you put it in the pocket 
and you know Dave made it easy to know where that was. So it was on us sometimes to um, but but that just the comping was so deep, and it made I mean it made us all stronger. Mm. We had to otherwise we were going to get destroyed. <laughs> like yeah. he was so strong, you know, and it in the most beautiful way. And at the same time, you know, his accompaniment would help shape the arc of your solo so much that. It was so weird for me. Like I played in that band. Sometimes I go play with other people and I would be blowing and the, the comping was not like that anymore. So I felt like, hey, what, what happened? Usually there's a, you know, we do a thing, you know, we have this and it's gone. <laughs> yeah. And so well, his, that was deep. <clears throat> yeah. His, uh, you know, um, it's, we were, and we still are, we're, Bernie and I are in the middle of, they invited me in to help mix this new record that's a compilation of live performances that we did over the last few years. And um, and I'm still learning about it, you know, about his idea of solo comp, you know, because, and Bernie was doing the same thing, that where we would mix the soloist, you know, up a little bit and bring the comp back a little bit, you know, a little, you know, just to make sure everything was being heard. And, and everything we presented to Chick back in November and December, you know, he was like, no, 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 turn the piano up and turn mm -hmm. the soloist down. Make it, it's a dialogue. It's a conversation. You know, it's always, you know, this and this and this. So that was truly his, you know, his feeling about it. And it's if you, if you mix it that way and you actually listen, it kind of makes sense because he's, you know, it's about that. He was just always listening, you know, and man, it's the, the live performances. You, you all got a lot to look forward to with this record. It's killing. It's going to be so good. It's a, well, it's a beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, his record. ears were so strong. Like you'd be playing and all of a sudden you'd be playing unison because he heard yeah. where you were going and he played exactly right. what you were going to play yeah. before you knew you were going to play it. So yeah. and sometimes right. we would just start laughing. Like I'd be playing and all of a sudden it'd be like there would be a phrase and he we would play the exact same. I would look at him like, how did you do that? Right. Exactly. Yeah, we you'd be you, you didn't know. I mean, the band always just felt like whenever we were playing, you know, it was just easy to play well. You know, to play your best. You know, rarely did you feel like, oh man, I just couldn't connect. And I think for me, it was you know combination of playing with you guys, and then with Chick, the way he would respond in comp, it was just so great. It would be like you know he would just be like laying this beautiful buffet of the most incredible meal you ever saw in your life and just all you have to do is pick that and pick that and pick that and no matter what you do it was going to be great because chick just created this bed that all you have to do is jump in you know and also it was just and and uh i remember frankie said this a million times but i never got to the point where i'd never you know well put it this way put it in the positive every time we were ever on stage i'd look over and i'd say damn that's that's Chick Corea, you know. <laughs> I'm on stage with Chick Corea, and, and it was such a, a pride in that that mm. it just it was an and, and every time we would we would walk, you know, we'd be in the in the uh, you know, like the green room getting ready to go on stage, and Chris would say, "Okay, five minutes," and and we start walking towards the stage, and there was just you could always just sort of feel this this um, you know unintended puffing of the chest, like yeah. You know, we're gonna we're gonna blow these people's minds. You know, this is gonna be great, and we just had such a have such a pride about um, about what we were doing, and the fact that it was it was Chick, and and we were like in this in Chick's band. I, I just can't tell you the the pride that I still feel. You know, I mean, as as awful as as this, this past month has been, you know, I just am so grateful of having had you know a lifetime of a career with you guys and and with chick and uh, you know it's indescribable mm -hmm. it brings us all to tears but but it's also just um uh, you know uh, you know the gratitude is is the, the love and gratitude has been like the, you know the main yeah. the main feeling frankly well i'll tell you i you know he um <clears throat> the one thing that that always just blew me away with with Chick. Of course, his musicianship and his you know um, his ability to you know to write and compose. I mean, he just was music. You know, without it goes without saying. But what always blew me away was his energy level, oh, and yeah. and this never went away. Um, you know, I mean, the guy was almost twenty years older than mo than most of us. And he made us look like, you know, old men in comparison sometimes, you know, it just the energy level was was off the charts. And it was so, 
inspiring and so invigorating that it was it was it kind of went hand in hand with the musical um, you know aspect of having to have your your stuff together right it kind of also put you in a position that it was like man there's there's like there's no slacking here you know it's like he no. he's the the <clears throat> ultimate consummate you know leader of of inspiration you know, you know uh, we used to do uh, when we played blue note for example in new york oh, we would God. do he... two full concerts a night i mean and we would do it for six nights straight yeah, that was us. And then he that would was do us. it. And then he would do another <laughs> 10 bands in a row. Yeah, you know, the, just... the Monday was off for the, for the ticket sales, but he would be rehearsing the next band for the next week. Yes. Oh. But what, what blew me away is, you know, after the shows, we'd all be in the dressing room. Going, uh, you know, it felt like we were hit by a Mack truck. And he would go, hey, guys, I got these guys. I want you to introduce you to blue. You know, he was just a powerhouse. I know. You know, incredible I know. I, I know for me as a as you know as a drummer and especially you know because I, I used to play a lot harder I, I have you know hand problems occasionally and you know body issues and and you know chicks <laughs> all with all the playing he he you know oh, do yeah. and, I, and I and I asked him you know recently like the last tour that we were together I said chick I said don't you don't your hands ever hurt you know don't you aren't you and he was like no <laughs> <laughs> you know, he just had, he just had, I, well, he would say, yeah, when you play too loud. Okay. I, so I, that was in the acoustic, that was in the acoustic yeah. trio. So that I was like, yep. Yeah, okay. I get it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, with all, with all the playing he, he would do, he had such command over the instrument and, you know, his way of, of approaching the piano and playing it. And it was just a, yeah, all was all cylinders firing, all energy, of the universe happening within him when he was playing that it was just it just kind of almost he wasn't almost doing it you know it was just an amazing thing so yeah we had this amazing you know thanks to him we had a quite a you know this amazing blend on stage just volume wise and the way it would all remember when um remember when the board exploded in the uh, the concert in santiago chile <laughs> Drum solo. We have to forget. <laughs> no, but our our power was still fire, high, right? I think. <laughs> and yeah, and so, but the I I I talk I do clinics um, to this day uh, with people in South America, and they said, "Oh yeah, I was at that concert." Um, yeah. Where the the front of house uh, system like literally like caught on fire. Yeah, like, they turned yeah, the monitors around. So the, the, the monitors. Monitors. Oh, that's right. I remember that. <laughs> we did front. Yeah. Well, yeah, we had we had our our stage thing so well balanced that we just turned the monitors that way, and okay, yeah, a little quieter. But, you know. And that was a big place. Oh, massive! Yeah. What about that concert in the park in Santiago uh, in um, Sao Paulo? Sao Paulo. I got Vera those thousand. Eighty thousand people. You know, one yep. thing that. I love about the Brazilians, I have to say this, because I remember the Pope John Paul was visiting Brazil at the same time. And we played that concert to 80,000 people. I'll never forget that day. That was the biggest show I've ever played. Me too. And my gear wasn't working when we got onto the stage. All the dials were spinning. There was something yeah. wrong with the power. <laughs> anyway. We got we got the concert going. That was the famous yeah. got no sound. The count <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden we're like, it was one, two. And Frank was like, got no sound. And we had to uh, <laughs> vamp, vamp. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, the next day in the news, newspaper, they had us on the cover, and the Jean Paul, the Pope, was on page two. And I thought, this is the country I could fall in love with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember. I remember going in, going in and out of that concert in the van. I, I felt yes. like we were the Beatles or something. Yeah, there were Everybody people lined like up for miles, banging on the, we were practicing the van our way. going like this. We, we oh, had yeah. a police escort. I mean, that was wild. That was yeah. Yeah. Oh, but we, we did the sound check that day in the park, and and we didn't see it was just an open park at that point, right? And it was yeah. uh, it was actually free. It was free to the public, but the, it was actually a free jazz. It was called the Free Jazz. Um, Festival. Literally free cigarettes. I guess it was a cigarette company game. Free, free yeah, free cigarettes. And uh, so yeah. then we went back to the hotel and we came back for the gig, and the the stage was up on a on a rise, mm -hmm. and so we we entered from the back, and so we didn't see the audience until we got on stage. We walk on stage, and it's just a sea <laughs> of 
heads of the party people were just standing there and they had you know the pa just like you know uh staggered and so i guess it was some sort of delay so that the you know yeah. they were mm-hmm. Yeah, it was the equivalent of playing in uh, Central Park, I think. We, a vibe like that, right? Basically, yeah. Mm. All right. It was yeah. incredible. You, you know, I, I also wanted to put a shout out to 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 Gail and uh, and Thad and Liana, chicks, mm. children, because um, I remember when they would come around, it was always really cool. They were really um, really warm. They they were cheering us on, and uh, and Gail, you know, my goodness, you know, she. She, she was definitely got me the gig, and 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 she was the right. one looking in the paper to go see Dave, and uh, yeah. she was cheering you two guys on too. I mean, she she was an extension of that energy, her. you know. Yeah, she, yeah. she was uh, to come to the gig and always be so up yeah. and energetic. So and sit in and sing so sing one of the hardest tunes ever written. Uh, right. uh, you're everything. You're everything. Oh my god. Uh, yeah. Remember, remember, was it when we finally got to Catalina's one time? He said, "Yeah, let's blow on it," and we were like, "You got it." <laughs> <laughs> one of the hardest tunes ever. Yeah, uh, I remember she sent uh, or somebody sent out a couple of videos. Uh, there's that that new documentary with Chick and that uh, the Spanish Heart Band, but there was another. Did you guys see the other video too? I think it's no. out there. I'll have to send it. Um, there's a lot of. Uh, well, I played with the. Uh, Return to Forever 4 as well, which was a great honor. And uh, we play uh, that tune. And on the, on the documentary, they left my solo on the end, which was which really surprised. It was an unplugged version of uh, Return to Forever. And um, yeah, those changes are squirrely. <laughs> yeah. But I was surprised that the solo was on the end of the video for the whole credit scene. So um, Well, because, you know, and I realized on the record, I was listening to... Uh, Light as a feather. They don't even blow on it on the record. No. There's no solo. But I remember when we did it at Catalina's in rehearsal, Chick was killing it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, really, like, unbelievable. And those are, I mean. Yeah, look, it doesn't matter stagger. what he's playing. You're, you're I mean, sounding he, surprised, he just, John. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not surprised, but then I know how hard that was and, and that he didn't even do it on the original record. He didn't even take a solo on those changes that he wrote. I had and he played it for us, uh, and it sounded like F blues. Like, okay, no problem. Sure. I remember that time we played. I think we played Blue Miles, and and went into double time maybe. And he he went to the piano. The acoustic piano started playing, and he. I mean, Chick Corea. We were just you know we were so used to hearing you know the world's greatest piano solos of all time <laughs> every single night. You know that that the bar was set pretty high. But this one night, he started blowing, and it was just so incredible. We we, we all looked at each other. We were, we started laughing. I mean, we all just started, you know, like, you know, how do you, you know, we're like, how do you react to this? I mean, you know, one of the, he was just like blowing so hard and it was just so incredible. Not like hard, hard, just like great, you know, to the point where we were just, you know, you know unbelievable. That's funny. But I think the band had that effect too sometimes. I mean, Chick's music was always incredible. And I remember Tale of Daring. In fact, the whole, the whole um, Inside Out tour that music was really heavy. And that tale of daring, I mean, it was a tale of daring just to record the bloody thing. But to play it live, I'll never forget. We would play it, and it would be blasting from start to finish. And it's epic, right? And we would have, you know, three, four thousand, five thousand people in front of us, and we'd end, and it was silent because people were still picking up their jaw from the ground. And it took them about 30 seconds to start applauding, applauding because they were just shocked. Yeah. That, well, uh, I don't, I don't, heard, you know, I don't so, know if you guys uh, remember, I don't know if you guys remember the record, the recording of that song, but yeah, when we you. got through it, when we got through it, it was like we had just scored a touchdown. I mean, we actually <laughs> all stood there, we're like, yeah! was, you know, and we're yelling yeah, and screaming just because we actually got through we the made charts. It. Oh, yeah. and oh we then made live, it. I mean, I don't know how long it is on the record. You mentioned 10 minutes, it might be a little bit more, but remember live, it got it stretched and it stretched. Oh man. <laughs> to the point, I think yeah. it was about 40 minutes, because I think it that was, was like, I think, yeah, I, think was the drum, like I think the drum solo piano duet was 10 minutes alone. It was at that 40 point. tales of daring. <laughs> it was like, well, remember the piano intros? That's that was the greatest. He'd go into no. these piano intros. They were amazing. 
Uh, and we yeah. wouldn't even realize it. And at the end, you know, the manager would go, yeah, well, the piano intro was 25 minutes. And then, the <laughs> was, you know. Uh, uh. Man. I remember one yeah. time uh, speaking also to Dick, not only musically, but he was just so generous with, with everybody. And, and so um, he, he, you know, he considered the road, you know, what you weren't just on the road and then you went home to relax. I mean, you had to be comfortable on the road. It was always a big thing. Oh, and yeah. we were, it was with us, right, that we were in um, Hamburg, Germany. Remember this? Well, we ended up at the Atlantic Hotel. And um, uh, we, we got the whole crew and band went to this hotel. It was a day off. And, um, and he didn't dig the hotel. And he, he went and, and the, the, the guy at the counter had an attitude and they, he wanted to go see one of the rooms and didn't dig the rooms. And the guy was kind of a drag. So he went to you know, whoever was uh, our manager, the, the road Wrong, manager, right? and said, and said uh, you know, we got to find a better hotel, you know. And he said, well, you know, we are in Hamburg, Germany. I mean, there is the Atlantic Hotel, the famous, you know, five-star. Great. Let's check it out. Are there rooms? And they called and said, yeah, there are rooms. So he took 20 people to the Atlantic. <laughs> that's how we got, that's how we got, and we stayed at this, you know. That's when I, when I, uh, when I saw Bob Crenshaw. Remember, John, I saw yes, Bob Yes, yes. I see Bob I Crenshaw, famous bass player. In the uh, in the lobby, and I say, "Hey, nice to meet you, Ben." <laughs> ben Crenshaw, golfer. Yeah, I was like, ben, ben, Crenshaw, golfer. ben is a golfer, but yeah. like, anyway. Yeah. But, but also, we got to put a shout out to Bernie because Bernie was with us on all these incredible adventures, and mm-hmm. always like so even keel and like you know we get to these places and maybe the the local thing was a mess, and Bernie would just kind of calmly get you know he he it was like um somebody who was a medic in the war like he would just go calmly straight forward the whole thing could be chaotic mash. just mash keep going <laughs> yeah he, he could keep going until and he would make the show sound great and he always man the cat and all the records always oh, all our records all our records too like i remember the all the and chick i chick remember got us uh, the record deals for eric and i i know that yeah, no bernie's Bernie, done every check Bernie, record since 1976 for the past 45 years yeah but, but he, he had it. incredible pedigree even before chick i remember him telling me one time that he was an intern on uh hendrix record yeah electric lady electric yeah. lady or? worked at electric lady i mean you know that's Hello. some serious, serious pedigree not to mention all the records he did before he found chick so uh, yeah, Bernie. Was, uh, he worked on some Stevie Wonder records too. I think he worked on Intervisions as a as a as a uh, a um, uh, you know assistant. You know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I yeah, said, we always had a great crew. We're busy mixing this. Uh, the yeah, just you about just about finished with the with the live compilation from from a few few tours we did since 2016 i think is uh, is kind of the earlier ones and and then up through the late ones and um it's a it's a it's an incredible um compilation of of what this band was you know and um and it's our last things together so it's uh, you know it's definitely in the works and and will be mm-hmm. coming out and everybody sounds fantastic and it's um, so that's something to look forward to as well mm-hmm. Yeah. What else, what's what's what else you guys want to talk about? Should we look and see if there's any questions that we maybe want to take? That's a good a little, idea at this point. A little bit. Yeah. Steve Orkin, did you uh, have you seen any in the background that uh, I've seen a couple of names here that I recognize? My, uh, my one of my first teachers, Bob Matheny, was in there. Maybe he's still hanging out. Um, you know, I saw a question go by that um, they asked somebody asked if we'd ever tour the electric band without Chick, and I th- I think we could pretty much all say. No. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, how who, do you do who that? would play keyboards? I mean, come yeah, on. Yeah, how do you yeah. do that? It's, uh, like, you uh, know, I think it's, uh, <laughs> I think it's, I think it's one of those things. I mean, obviously, we're, we're, we're all hoping to continue touring um, there were individually and with different things and maybe together on some things, but uh, mm-hmm. as we go forward and hopefully get back to touring soon. Um, but no, it's uh, you know trying to trying to do anything. I think I speak for everybody. I'm, I'm guessing I'm gathering here that you, know, you can't you can't do a Chick Corea anything without Chick Corea. It doesn't work. To me, so. it's one of the saddest things about this whole passing of Chick. You know, is that we won't 
play as the electric band ever again. That's really, to me, one of yeah. the saddest things of all. Yeah. But I'll tell you, the, the, the positive side of it is that kind of blows me away. And I don't, I don't mean this from like a pretentious egotistical standpoint at all, because because um, I generally don't ever like to listen to myself play at all. But I've gone back and like listened and watched some of the videos from, you know, from the earlier tours. And, you know, it's not it's not about, oh, God, he was great. He was great. He was it's the band was like really incredible i mean you know it it, and it 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 was just a thing you know that uh was just a you know it was the it was the product of chick's energy all put into again what we've been talking about what he did for us to bring us together to put us in that position to be at the top of our game at least to attempt to keep up with him <laughs> and uh you know it's just to be able to have those memories and, and relive them all. It's uh, it's a beautiful thing on top of, of course, knowing we can't do it again, but um, but boy, the memories sure are beautiful. You know, yeah. you know what, 30, too? Dave, years, man, that was a long yeah. time to play with them. But, but you know, also, <laughs> he, his, he's, he represents something that um, is hard to find anymore. Um, when he was coming up, there were all these mentors who had bands. There was Miles, mm -hmm. there was Blakey, there was, you know, this and that. Coltrane had an unbelievable band, obviously, and, and there were, you know, different periods. For us, Chick was our mentor, you know, like he he taught us so much. You couldn't help but it was like every gig was a master class if you paid attention. You know, sure. just the way he dealt. And also his, his priority on making it a band thing, not about individual, it wasn't like about what anybody just played like getting getting lost in or in, you know kind of caving in on themselves and worrying too much about what they did it was always the whole the whole package and i think that's why he stressed having a real group blend and having a real interplay in the solos so that it was always about the family the group not just right. individuals right mm -hmm. yeah. I, I see. Um, I see another question here. That uh, John, I think you got a little backstory on this. Um, any story behind "Got a Match" from Nathaniel? Oh my gosh! So, <laughs> I like an idiot. Oh. I like an idiot when he brought the tune in at first. Um, we're playing the tune and we're trying to figure out what to do. And then, after a while, we started getting into it and learning it pretty well. And then I volunteered to play the melody, which was my first mistake. So <laughs> then. Um, I volunteered to play the melody, and I learned the melody, and so we're playing the melody, and everything is cool. It's still hard. Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> and uh, and he never slowed that tempo down in all his years. Like all the reunion stuff, I'd have to shed my tail off knowing that in a few months that was going to be there, and I was going to have to confront it again. Because it wasn't like when we were kids, when we were playing 200 concerts a year, you could have woken anybody up out of a sound sleep, thrown water on him, and counted it off at 300 or whatever he does it at. And we could play it. But when you don't play it for 10 years, and all of a sudden he's still bur playing that same tempo, man, mm -hmm. you've got to come shed it up. You know, so anyway, um, so uh, like I said, uh, in one of my maybe uh, not too smart moves, I, I volunteered, played them. Okay, so I learned the melody, and I'm feeling pretty safe at that point until a plane ride from L.A. to San Francisco. And he's sitting next to me, and pulls out a piece of music paper and starts writing all these eighth notes and all this stuff and then all of a sudden the page is full of stuff and i'm like chick what is that and uh what are you doing over there and he's right next to me he goes oh you'll see when we get there so mm -hmm. we get there and it's all those shout chorus things for match oh the lines up at all that yeah, right. he wrote it on the plane going up damn <laughs> he did all that it was just like oh yeah and that's like less than an hour flight but he was just blasting. He was just. I used to joke with him after a while. I said, "You can't write a tune anymore. Whenever you sit down, you write a suite. <laughs> when you when you sit down, you write an album. You don't write." I know a little. We should tell people where the title come from. It was right. from Joe, Joe Farrell, Farrell. Yeah. who uh, smoked a lot, and he'd always say, "Hey, Kirk, got a match? What time is it?" Always got a match. He, what time is it? He was always <laughs> trying to talk like uh, Jackie Byard, which Chick hit me to when because I, I played with Joe first. Before chicken, and Joe would talk like this: "Hey, chick, what are you doing?" So, so that's where the title comes. What time is it? 
It yeah. was dedicated to Joe Farrell, we pre presume, the great Joe Farrell. I think when I, yes. when I first got that call, too, I remember thinking, you know, man, this is, you know, my first thought was how incredible it was that I was getting called to be in the band. My second thought was that, oh, my God, I'm going to have to play that tootie line and got a match, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no tootie lines. Well, we all played it in unison a lot of times. Man, yeah, one or two, right? Yeah. So. Well, you guys always nailed it, that's for sure. Um, Frankie, do, uh, guys, do we see any other questions here that we might want to that we might want to take? Yeah, let's see. All of Chick's work is masterpiece. Um, how long? I don't know. They're going by so fast. I can't yeah, that's uh, yeah. Exactly. Oh, you gotta love that. Um, they don't stay long enough for me to answer anything. I'm serious. I mean, folks. I love you all. Thanks for all for joining us here today. Yeah, Steve. Uh, Steve mentioned. Planet. Steve mentioned we have over four thousand people viewing at one time here. Oh, so okay. that, cool. that's uh, that's awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in and hey, wait, wait, wait. sharing with us. Hold you know. on a second, Wally Grant. Wally Grant is the engineer. I saw my buddy Rob the Gonzalez there from New York, Robbie. You know, uh, probably Robbie. later, brother. Hey, Wally. Uh, Wally Grant just piped in about the story. And, and Wally, I did tell the story earlier on. I'm sorry you missed it. But I told the whole story of about being at the studio. So um, I'm sorry you missed your story. But you were the star of that story. Yeah. What was your favorite Chick Corea song? John Cool Jack. To play. Favorite, favorite song? That's hard. I mean. Play. It says. Of our that question yeah, is yeah. is difficult i mean that's like you know who's the best who's uh let's say you know because man yeah. the, the, with chicks music, everything was yeah. everything was so much fun playing you know because because every song uh, every song gave a different you know element mm -hmm. of you know favoritism ah this one grooves i remember i always used to like to play sidewalk you know with the with the oh, sequence yeah. you know in three four three four five thing that, you know yeah. and uh you know, but then at the same time, you know, doing, you know, anything Latin that we used to play, you know, was, uh, mm -hmm. which there was a bunch in Tale of Daring, if I'm not mistaken. Somebody talked yeah. about Time Track before. Time mm -hmm. Track. That's right. a killer right. song. Uh, They're all right. killer songs. I mean, yeah. he wrote, there's a lot of stuff, View from the Outside on that record, too. It's a lot oh, of yeah. compositional stuff that was really deep. I had a line or two. Yeah. Uh, what about, uh, you know, from To the Stars, I think there's some exceptional stuff on there. Alan Corday, of uh, course. Oh, no. Well, Uncle Day, I mean, I mean, Check Blast. <laughs> that tune is so <laughs> insane. From the first tune of the album, I mean, what a way to present. Here we are, chaps. Yeah. Check right. this if, you on, a, if you go but online. But the uh, tune uh, that really blew me away the most on that record, for personal taste, was uh, Jocelyn. You know, there's that piece is so extraordinary as a composition to me that he could make a bass line and a melody, and that's it. Two parts make this incredible sound. The the, the harmony and the way Eric played it on the on the alto was so fantastic. The tone and the the, the, the sentiment. It was such an extraordinary composition to me. You know, one and of the among things, millions. <laughs> that yeah, he wrote. Mia, you know, every time we would play, you know, we've all heard Spain so many times, but but Chick would have this melodic and it would be different every time we'd ever play it. And it was just, that was to me one of the more uh, remarkable uh, solos, especially when he played on, not just on piano, it didn't matter what instrument he played it on, but he just had this amazing, I mean, this made probably the tears almost every night. I mean, it felt like an emotional, like almost choking up. And when he would do the, the sing along with the audience, mm -hmm. you know, the little melodies that he would come up with, which is so, it was, you know, seemed kind of off the cuff and it, like, like not, maybe not paying attention to it so much because you're trying to elicit a response from the audience, you know. But remember the, the melodies that he would have them, have the audience sing were always just like, like without an exception, you know, thousands really over the years, you know, it was just incredible, you know. It was mm -hmm. just, and whatever he would play, it would work. And that tune seems like harmonically, you've got to be careful about the corners, but it all just sort of, when he played it, it was all just kind of like, it felt like one harmonic bed that was like, you know, like a, a blues almost, or it, I just remember, you know, and the version of, of Czech Blast, Frank, too, and of Spain from uh, 
and you can see it it's got a million gazillion views on YouTube, but from Montreux in 2004. There's um, actually a DVD that we from the whole show. Right. Yeah, really? oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a heck of a show, actually. Yeah. No. yeah was, so, somebody, uh, somebody just mentioned King Cockroach, and I have a funny story <laughs> about that because that's a great soon, amazing yeah, composition that we played a lot, especially with the with the trio and then with the guitar. And Eric, you played that too with us, right? When you first got in the band. Mm -hmm. uh, one day, yeah. my dad, my dad, out of nowhere, you know, I'm talking to my dad, and he's not like totally into jazz, but he said, "Man, why don't you guys play King Cockroach anymore?" I was like, "Dad." <laughs> you remember that he said yeah and he told chick he said my favorite song is king cockroach why don't you guys play that and I was <laughs> so he, he loved he connected with that song that's an amazing composition beautiful composition. a lot of incredible stuff mm -hmm. in there they're all amazing compositions mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's it's, right. it's so prolific unbelievable wow. yeah well uh what's the what's the largest number of concerts you played in a year and a month well i don't know I don't know if I'll never got forget the, uh, the uh, that European tour that we did. I think Over two months we had a record uh, uh, of doing twenty-seven nights straight, and I remember this: twenty-seven nights straight, one day off. And the only reason it was a day off is because the the gear would not make it by truck or the bus from I think it was somewhere in like Poland to Sicily. It was some crazy journey that we did overnight. And then we did another 17 straight. So, that, I mean, we, we were working hard and we were playing a lot of shows. I remember that European tour being quite exhausted after that. I just, I just got exhausted. I just got exhausted right now thinking about that. <laughs> we'd all wake up, you guys, when you had hair. I mean, when I had hair, we'd... Uh, yeah. Rephrase. Wake up with remember, trying, to get the laundry done. trying to get the laundry done on two months <laughs> yeah. plus tour. That was always a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember, I remember it's, I think that, I think the year that I decided to move to LA from New York, I think we were on the road basically for 10 months. I mean, it, it kind of added up to be 10 months mm -hmm. or at least eight months. Really? Out of the year. We, yeah. Cause I remember the longest tour, I think maybe it was 10 mm -hmm. and a half weeks, something like that, that we did all at once, but they were always kind of, you know, there was the spring, there was the summer and there was the fall and we were touring in all of them. So yeah. it was, you know, there were, yeah. it seemed like it was and then, and then John, when we started doing the acoustic trio, we were doing both. Yeah. Yeah. That, was the, that was the period. Yeah. yeah. So the electric band, there was one main electric band two tour that we did that was 14 weeks long. We did um, 90, it was, I think it was 90 days long. Jeez. Yeah. And, and we did 82, we played 82 cities uh, across <laughs> 24 countries in 90 days. And, um, yeah, that was, you don't deserve a medal after that, you know. Yeah. So, and I remember uh, we were like so exhausted, like so, like you know, like going into the twelfth round of a boxing match, you know. And and earlier we were talking about Dick's energy, and you know, and yeah, he was a bit older than, than the rest of us, and we were just like dragging our butts, and and Chick was, you know. He'd be like after the gig. He, I think, after that tour, he went off to do a, a solo concert tour uh, with uh, an orchestra in Europe, and he'd be practicing, you know, the Mozart piano concerto uh, yeah. after the gig. You know, we could go and pl play in our rooms. You know, and, and uh, that was another actually funny story. When we were, uh, I used to practice in my hotel room. You know, I, I thought I was playing quietly, and uh, there was one. Uh, one day he calls me and he says, uh, hey, Eric, would you mind kind of cooling it a little bit? I'm going to take a nap. I said, sure. Are, are you next to me? He said, well, what room are you in? I said, I'm in, uh, I'm in 924. He said, oh, uh, I'm in 616. <laughs> 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 we Sorry. always used to have you as far on the end of the hotel as possible. <laughs> but I always found it comical that on the road, no matter where we were, there was always construction. And one time we were in Stockholm and we stayed at this hotel that was outside of town and right next to us was a vacant lot with this <laughs> rock. I mean, it was like solid rock and they had the giant mats on and they were doing actual blasts <laughs> <laughs> with dynamite. <laughs> And I, ah, you know, you've just flown, you know, half half a million miles and you're coming in to rest in a nice quiet hotel and they're using dynamite outside. I mean, for Christ. You know, you know, I used to it got to the point where 
when we were pulling into town, I used to say, oh, look, there's the hotel, because that's where the crane was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And then, and then once we got to the hotel, it's like I know where my room is. I'm just going to change it right now because I know it's going to be right next to the construction. So, yeah. yeah. Why is it that they something. always want to put you at the right next to the construction? Like, come on. Right. I know. Yeah. Not like they're not aware of this construction. Exactly. Yeah. Not part of the joys of being on the road, I guess. Yeah. Somebody's oh, asking, what? what was it like? This is a funny question to me because. I'll just give you a perspective that I think we share. Somebody said, what was it like being famous in the eighties? We had no idea. I mean, when I joined, I think we were so excited just to play with chick. We really didn't know it was going to be a thing. We just were so into the music and it, it was like the gig of a lifetime. I wasn't thinking, well, I'm going to get this gig and I'm going to be yeah. famous. No, we were just like, we were young. We, we were just thanking God that we had this opportunity to play with him. And we had no idea it was going to be something that people were going to sort of connect with in that way. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's beautiful no uh, that the the effect that the band had. You know, we we were so caught up in it while we were doing it that we, you know, we didn't realize it was having such an impact, and it, it really did have a lot of impact on people's life. I remember, you know, and then we kept playing for many many years, so people were bringing their kids. You know, so we started hitting a, a second generation. Of, uh, <laughs> Don't want to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. Now we get, man, my dad grew up listening to you. Yeah. 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 Ooh. Right. Yeah, I was young. There's a question. There's a question here. Uh, did Chick use a KX5 on the original recording of Rumble from Greg Varlata? Yes. Uh, I believe so. Yes, yeah. he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, the song Rumble, you know, um, what was the what was the opening Sequence eight. things? No, no, yeah, <laughs> that's what it was. The robot City thing. Eight. Remember the City robot eight. thing? Oh, right. City but, eight but, eight. Uh, but both both live and in the studio, you know, there was a sequence uh, written, which is would be now called a backing track, where there was uh, John. You were actually doubling a synth bass line. Yes. Um, -do -do -do, right. The yes. whole line. Until Eric. And then, and, we played. and then Chick had had written a, a little drum machine part that had a hi hat and the and the bass drum and the snare drum, and and so I had to come up with a part around it, um, and I had a tambourine triggered from my floor tom, and and the rest of it was you know uh, was just the drum set. But so yeah, we we pretty much played that on the recording like we did live, and Chick definitely used the KX5 for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That thing was a bit unpredictable, too. You know, it was an old piece of tech, and I especially remember in some of the later tours we did where he, he had to drag that thing out of mothballs sometimes. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, we tried the wireless MIDI on a several occasions, and it would just hang on a note in the middle of his song, and you go, ah! You know, he'd have to go and re-trigger. Right. And so that's right. a, he, then he went back to the cable, and that was it. You know, the MIDI right. cable, thank you. Yeah. Didn't somehow um, trigger trigger a, a factory demo at the end <laughs> at the end of the song on that one gig at Catalina, <laughs> and then we started playing along with it, <laughs> and it was like a really that. funny, silly demo. It was like a dumb little thing. I remember a funny story. You guys may remember this too. It just came to me. It was uh, we were playing a festival in Atlanta, and I'll never forget this as long as I live. Oh. You know. All the box seats, which were the, you know, the, the seats that people buy and it's like subscription. And all our fans are about 100 miles away. And you could right. barely hear them at the end of a song because people were clinking their wine glasses. Oh, and we were outside. Their yes. chicken. That's just so Chick, Chick, That's it. Just the, at one point he just said, I hate this. <laughs> and he goes into uh, Misty. With the wrong right. chords. With the substitutions. Minor chords. Major chords. And it's, it's, I almost lost my, I couldn't, I fell over backwards. It was so funny <laughs> that he just lost it. He went, screw the this, people, nobody's listening. Yeah, they didn't even notice. The people in the front didn't even notice. Yeah, they went, oh, I like that one. 
Oh, yeah, that was, he was the right. funny. That's the thing we haven't talked a lot about. And he was hysterical, man. That version of Misty, he would do that at Soundcheck sometimes. He would play it. And it was so funny so, because he was like really into the Marx Brothers and all the old comedy guys. He was he just that <laughs> was hilarious. <laughs> Not even the right words. That's right. <laughs> oh, 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 I remember oh, play the tonic. <laughs> I remember. I remember you guys, John. He's flat you, major, you, you know, just e da da. <laughs> Brilliant. You guys used to do that with a bunch of songs. He would. He would do that oh. with. Uh, start oh, right. reharmonizing with major chords or whatever it was. It er, and Eric tunes. was the culprit of a lot of those too. He, yeah. would, he would fracture you the would melody. Hammer up to and there. Eric. Would like, uh, <laughs> oh, man. That's all those Disney days, right, Eric? Uh, you know. <laughs> oh, hey, man, I, the, what about Chick Two with oh, his favorite thing in the whole world were were critics that came oh, to boy. review the shows. <laughs> Remember that? And yeah. invariably, they always got front row seats, and they'd, they'd be sitting there with their pencil, taking notes, and he and or people that would fall asleep or something in the front row. He always had a a thing about that that he just would try to wake him up or something. <laughs> he'd play something really loud. To... Well, and he uh, got, just, did, did he get you guys funny. that book too? He, he, um, I remember yes. when we first started, you know, we, we would get critics and they would say some crazy stuff and, and he bought us, I think he probably bought every one of this, this, uh, Nicholas Slin Slinimsky history of musical invective book, Yeah, which mm -hmm. was great. It's got yeah. uh, reviews of Mozart and yeah. letters yeah. to his father going, this guy, he's horrible, you know, or, or people panning <laughs> right of spring. Or, yeah. you know, like, just, and it made you feel a lot better. Cause you were like, wow, check that out. It's, yeah. Right. That's right. great. Oh. Yeah, hey guys, there's a there's a there's a topic here that that I I, I think we we should touch on that was because it you know, one thing it definitely dates us as to how old we are. But uh, Rich F says talk about the live mixing where you all have to push buttons to get the mix. Now if I'm if I'm reading that how I'm taking it, or at least I'm going to transfer it to what I t I'm taking it as. Do you remember in the first records? where this was before when we were all in the studio and I'm not sure who all took part in, but I, but I remember us all being there on occasion where um, it was before automation. So the mixes actually became a performance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We were all yeah, standing no, oh, yeah. at the, at oh, the mixing board. board with yeah. Bernie. And, and the thing, you know, it's this big Neve console, the size of a, you know, freaking Cadillac Eldorado. Right. And we're, we're all like, all of us are, we have our, we have our faders and our jobs to do, <laughs> to actually mute, raise, pan, do whatever we have to do. And it's like, you know, if one guy screwed it up, you have to do it all over again. So it was like another instance of, ah, we got it. We got the mix, you know, so <laughs> that's what we used to have to do back then. So yeah, that was, that, that was some comedy. That was fun the too. Days. Chick had his own special language too, that he, uh, he discovered when he was in high school, he would put oh, a the B. the kind of thing. He yeah, would put yeah, a B right. before every syllable, syllable. And my name would be Frabank Gabam Babalabi, which is oh. quite, quite <laughs> funny to me. Yeah, Czech Korean would be <laughs> Chibik Kabor Biaba. That's right. I remember that. And he, he would always call me Franklin Delano, which is right. the famous president. I never I got Jonathan to Livingston. Frank, ever, I, don't yeah. think. I was Arabic. Oh, yeah, Livingston. Yes. Arabic. They're Arabic, Arabic or Iraq, as we lovingly refer uh, yeah, to. Yeah, I guess. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, we all had the banter, the band names. Yeah. Uh, Any other questions? Let's see. Yeah, a couple here. You had enough of your thirsty for more, folks. Yeah, we've been on. We've been on two hours already. So. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> Yeah, just seeing if there was anything here that we missed. Uh, How did recording with the electric band yeah, look like and the food? <laughs> <laughs> well, Chick's food, I, I used to love that. When uh, Later on in life, he lost like 150 kilos or something. He, he went from this to whew, the same size he was when he was in high school. And same with Gail. They lost amazing amounts of weight. And they they got very strict. They became very strict vegetarian. And I, I loved the food that was, you know, uh, backstage uh, on the la last few tours we did, especially right. that 2017 tour. 
uh, it was always amazingly healthy. Chick would show up to whatever the city we were in, and he always had an assistant who would he would send off to the nearest grocery store to buy veggies and stuff. And and he had his own blenders in in the room, and he would make his own incredible blends. And he got quite proficient at that too. I mean, this is quite yeah. beside the music that that we all know and love from Chick. But he he became a very healthy, uh, I really thought he would live to 100 uh, uh, or more um, because he was so incredibly uh, diligent about it. He made his own um, Dressing. salad dressings and yeah. stuff that were just, everything we tasted was just so great, you know. And do you so, remember, uh, do you remember yeah. when we, we, we would go to Italy before all that? Oh. And we, we would go to, the, go to gig, play the soundtrack, and then we'd go eat at some amazing restaurant. And we thought after the dinner that basically we were going to fall asleep and not wake up for about 10 years. But then we'd go play the gig, and it was so exciting. And uh, Chick really enjoyed. His favorite pasta was spaghetti aglio with the, uh, you know, I, the garlic right. and the olive oil. John, I'll never forget one time the three of us, you, me, and Chick, we were playing in Naples. It's always something happening in Naples. It's a bizarre, <laughs> bizarre town. My dad, you, my dad, my parents are from near Naples, so my dad used to tell me stories. He says, you got to watch it there. The thieves are so good, they'll steal your socks before your shoes. <laughs> and so, but anyway, we went and had, we walked across the street. We were right on the waterfront. There was a castle. We went down and had the giant buffalo mozzarella, which was oh. incredible. But I'll never forget the next day. We were, we had to leave Napoli and fly, and there was a bus that came to pick us up. And you have to recall this because I remember the traffic was horrendous in the direction oh, yes. that we were going. And there was nobody on the other side. There was three lanes, and there was a cement thing about this high <laughs> that divided the roads. And this bus driver said, screw this. An entire bus. He backs up and then he, he attempts to go over this barrier, which he manages to do without <laughs> most of the bottom of the bus was probably missing by the time we got to the other side. And then he starts barreling down the wrong side of the road. Just to I get remember us to that. the airport on time. I'll never forget. That's that right. was, I couldn't even watch. I was like this. Oh my gosh. There, there, was, there was another one the first time we went to, was it Korea or some, some place? in the Far East, maybe it was, um, I don't know, we decided that we were stuck in this massive traffic jam and we were almost to the hotel, but we wanted to go around to the front of the hotel. Big mistake. Mm -hmm. we, we should have just gone in the back because it took us an hour to get from the back oh, yeah. of the hotel to the front. <laughs> we were like, ah, you know. Hey, I see a, I see a question here that I'll, I can answer very quickly. Did Chick write, uh, the song Master Plan from my record. Yes, he did. And he composed that. I have to tell because this is a little bit of a back to Korea story that's, that's, that was so cool for me that when I did my first record, I entitled it Master Plan. And I asked Chick, please write uh, a song that would uh, provide a platform for, for the great Steve Gadd and I to play together. And, mm -hmm. um, and what I wanted to do because of the uh, original recording that I heard, first heard Steve with Chick in that studio, Mad Hatter with Anthony Jackson. I wanted to recreate mm -hmm. the session and put myself in the middle of it, you know, and um, and and basically that's what happened for Master Plan. So yes, Chick create he wrote that uh, incredible oh, song cool. for for my record that mm -hmm. Steve and I did a little duet. So yeah, beautiful. yeah, another beautiful moment, another beautiful composition from the master. Somebody's asking, Frank and Bolly, what was Chick's reaction to your sweet picking fast runs? <laughs> well, he, he liked them. But, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I created this new tuning for the guitar, which I call Gambali tuning, and it enables me to play close voicings just like a piano, so I can play virtually any chord. And I discovered this right before we were doing the To, to the Stars album. And so I, I had this uh, Yamaha silent guitar, and, and I, I wanted Chick to hear this. You know, I put, it, put headphones on his head, and I said, Chick, check out what I've discovered. And I'd play these chords with, that, to a guitar player, are completely impossible. And Chick went, yeah, yeah, great. 
to him it meant absolutely nothing because he can play all those chords all day long. I mean, damn, I gotta have to share this with a guitar player who'll understand. So that was one little anecdote from, I remember from the To the Stars. I love recordings. He says, "Yeah, great." That was it. <laughs> <laughs> great discovery, you know. I've reinvented the wheel. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Hey, our uh, our friend Bob Rice just uh, who did some. Hello, hey, Bob. Hey, Bob. Bob. Yeah, he just he just posted something nice here about uh, how Chick would receive people backstage and um, you know after the shows and um, and they would approach him with their hands shaking and he was just saying that Chick had this beautiful ability to to shift that energy around and make those make those people tell him about their own lives, you know, and that, that's another, you know, so, such mm -hmm. a great lo loving story. Yeah, that was a very, about Chick. very commonly. I mean, whenever, you know, we always want our friends to come back after, after gigs and meet Chick, and it was always such a source of pride. But I always remember, not just with friends, but everybody, um, you know, I, you have to imagine that a person like Chick Corea would, would, you know, it, everybody wants to meet Chick and, and get their picture or whatever. And Chick was always, he he was careful about who you know he, who who he got a chance to talk to after a gig or whenever. Not because he was trying to avoid anybody, but because he wanted to make sure that everybody that he did encounter and communicate with that he gave them their his full attention. And and everybody I ever all my friends over the years who had the pleasure of meeting him backstage or wherever always commented like. You know, like uh, how engaged 100% Chick was, and he wasn't just doing it just to sign a record and okay, kid, get out of here. You know, um, you know, Mike Silverman, our, our dear friend um, in St. Louis, you know, had that experience. We played in, in Miami not that long ago, actually, and he came up, and I thought, and Rob Silverman may have been there too. I forget, but uh, I think he was actually, and um, and he he talked to Mike for a long time after the gig, and this is after a whole concert and kind of okay, it'd be great to go back to the hotel and go to sleep, you know. But uh, you know, they talked for a good half hour, I think, and and um, I was just I was very, it was it was really cool. It was a great example too of how you know Chick was just so giving of himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, we miss him. We miss him. Somebody yeah. asked about if we've ever had the chance to change Chick's mind regarding his composition or a specific part. And um, I, I don't think, um, I don't remember that. I do remember him giving us an enormous amount of freedom in the way we interpreted his incredible music. Like he gave us a lot of a leeway to interpret because I, I think after a while he started writing for us. He would tell us that. He said, I'm writing yeah. with you guys in mind. So uh, yeah, I can think of two examples of that for me. I mean, Charged Particles was written w at, to feature the guitar. You know, here, here's these changes, here's this melody. He would feature us. You know, now I remember. You know, he he uh, enjoyed the sweep picking thing a lot. And for me, Check Blast. You know, sometimes that was the first tune of the night. And there's this arpeggio in there that actually I did ask him to change because I remember Chick in the key that it's in. I'm sorry, man. Like, I can usually play anything you throw at me, but this is impossible on the guitar. It just doesn't work. But I can play it up a third. So if I can play this arpeggio, this crazy, just, it, it goes by in about two seconds, but it's one of the hardest things of all the electric band things that I ever have to play. Uh, and he says, yeah, okay. And then, so we ended up doing it as a harmony. Why am I hearing an echo now? Anyway, so uh, you know, you know, he did write with us in mind, and it was it was a beautiful thing. After all those years, he really was familiar with all our capabilities, and and he really, I really felt like it was for us this music, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. For he, us was to play. he was flexible. If something was uh, a certain way that maybe you know it would maybe come out a little quick, uh, easier if you changed a little thing. He would never, he trusted in our our, uh, our, interpreta inter our interpretation of his music because we were so invested in his music after a while. It was like, you know, the thing that I, I learned when I started playing sometimes with other people who tried to write music like him, 
was his even the hardest music that he wrote usually you could find a good fingering and it would lay mm -hmm. finally it would lay really well mm -hmm. sometimes you play with other people who try to write they they come in with the thing of well, i want to write something really hard and it doesn't lay very well because it's not really conceived melodically it's just conceived technically his music was always melodically and harmonically driven and rhythmically you know had a had a had a point to it it had a, a you were you felt like you were being taken on a journey mm -hmm. i remember a uh, tale of daring looking at the chart and thinking this chart has every rhythm ever written <laughs> in, it, in one go you know they were compositions like that it just had everything look here's an entire course in composition study this you know exactly and there were other tunes of his in the past that i remember that i felt the same way about there was this um return to forever tune called um the musician which to me is one of the greatest compositions ever on anything it just is the book on composition right here you study that and you're done you know? <laughs> Lee has a question about um, what was the smallest stage we ever had to cram onto. <laughs> I remember. The Blue Nose? It was Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. Do you guys remember that show? Oh, oh no. It was an Italian mob joint or something. Oh, yeah. What the hell oh, yeah. it was. Wow. They the had big, to the Big the Apple story. Jazz Club. In, uh, oh, wow. You guys got some that memories, night, man. I'll never forget because I was – trying out these new earplugs because the band was getting a bit loud. Oh, that's right. Especially me. <laughs> and uh, they were made of wax, and I had a piece in my ear, and it's uh, halfway through the first set. Somehow it had just plopped into my ear, and it was hitting my eardrum, so I was starting to go completely insane, going <laughs> trying to get it out of my ear. And I remember being between sets, I said, they had to take me to the hospital to... <laughs> to find a doctor to pull it out. And so right. I, I remember it going, out it came. <laughs> and I went, thank you, thank you. And I rushed back for the, the second set. Well, you guys, after the second set, you guys have gone. And I remember we had Dan. Danny Burns. Uh, Danny Burns. Burns, a young little blonde-haired guy. He was only about 23. And our manager, Ron Moss, was kind of training him to take over the reins as At least for you know, road manager. manager. Right. Well, after the show, you, everybody had gone. It was just the crew packing up from that gig. And I decided, look, I wanted to play piano. I was dying to play piano a little bit. So I got on Chick's piano while everybody's packing up around me. And, and I remember Danny going in to the back room to get the money for the show. And it didn't go very well. <laughs> Apparently, the... The guy didn't want to pay, right? And we had a completely full house, both shows. Guy was drunk. He came out with a gun and he started away. Everybody got out of my bleeping club. And if people are diving under tables, I'm under the piano going, oh, all my Christmases at once. Uh, I thought we were all going to die. <laughs> the guy, but some, the, the two of the bouncers managed to restrain this guy. We never got paid. And uh, I think the club, you know, the word got out and B.B. Uh, King or someone was supposed to play there a couple of nights later and the place got shut down. But, whew. You know, you know the word, the word about Danny, Danny Burns was one of the great tour managers that we ever had. Yeah. Great, great guy. Ooh, he learned uh, the hard way on that gig, that's yeah, for sure. <laughs> he became one of the greatest, I thought. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, you know, you mentioned it, John, but the Blue Note was always was always a challenge in New York to fit on that stage. That was that was that was a bit tough. That was yeah. a bit tough. Human but always, pyramid. always fun. You know, somebody had asked before too, like, what was the, what was the nightmare gig where everything went wrong? You know, and I, I mean, you guys got the memories here. I can't remember anything, but but I never remember like a you know, just a, a situation where whatever it was, if there was something going on bad or negative that we didn't overcome, you know, that was like, I, I can, for me, it's like all the gigs were just great. You know, all the gigs mm -hmm. were the memory of playing all the shows. It's, uh, you know, there was never bad 
vibes, bad no. gigs, or whatever. You know, it was just a beautiful. Although I do remember one with Electric Band Two. We were in in Spain. That doesn't count. We don't. Uh, count. Yeah, oh, yeah there was a, a there was a bomb scare in the theater. We we were about halfway, through, not even halfway through the concert, and and uh, yikes. Uh, and forgive me if you guys are watching. I forget if it was Danny or or um, I forget who the. Uh, Maybe it may have been Chris actually even at that point, but um, no, I think it was still Danny. Danny. Maybe it was, it was Danny. Danny. And we're in the middle. About the in fact, I'm in the middle. I think I'm in the middle of a solo, and and, and Danny comes running out on, on the stage, <laughs> and and you know we're we're playing in front of you know 2,500 <laughs> people or whatever, and and whispers something to Chick, and they both stand up, and Danny says, looks at us and goes, "Follow me." <laughs> <laughs> we stop playing. We go running out the back of the hotel, and it was a bomb scare, and I guess it was. You know, and the audience, I guess it happened like all the time, you know, and so the, <laughs> the promoter went over to Chick and we're all out on the sidewalk. And now the audience is out on the side, sidewalk, you know, there's a gazillion people. And he said, well, you know, the promoter goes up to Chick and says, yes, we have this call, but, you know, it happens all the time. I think it will be probably fine and we should go back and finish the concert. And Chick said, yeah, but what if this is the time where it's not a false alarm? <laughs> you know, I'm not going to take responsibility of, you know, just to finish this concert. Just you know, and in case something terrible happens, so we didn't. Uh, so that was one that was, didn't end perfectly. You guys had quite a few uh, electric band two incidents, didn't you? Also, almost die in an airplane crash. Oh yeah, trying to oh yeah, that was in, called in the Hong nine Kong. lives. Jesus. We called it the nine lives tour. We were on a on the uh, in a bus, and and uh, we were on a bridge, and the bridge like ended. And, and, the, and the, suddenly we, were, we all fell out of our bunks because the bus driver had to make this crazy, you know, emergency thing in the middle of the night. And if he had kept going on the lane, in that lane, you know, he would have gone off this 40 foot embankment, you know. Yeah. And then we were on an airplane going from London to Leeds and uh, we take off and uh, the, the one of the tires blew up and the rubber got sucked into the back engine. The engine blows up and the flames coming out of the thing. And we came back around and there's, you know, there's emergency, you know, lights on the thing. They foam down the tarmac and we, you know, we land and we had to actually, you know, jump out of the emergency exit. Holy cow. That thing actually does weigh 40 pounds, you know. And, uh, I, I, I just remembered one. The other thing too is we got a shout out to Chris Campbell, one of the great Chris road directors of all yes. time. He's with yes, us, been yes. with, with us for many, many years. So yeah. here's one that I remember. You guys remember this? We're in Germany and the bus is going down the street and I remember we're going down the street and all of a sudden I hear a thump. And the guy keeps going. And all of a sudden we get to an intersection and all these German cops are like guns drawn. They stop the bus. Apparently he had clipped the, his mirror had clipped the mirror of a police vehicle. Oh. <laughs> so all of a sudden it looked at it like a, at an old scary movie. All of a sudden these cats are like, they're drawn. The guns are drawn. They're in the middle of the street and we're on a big bus. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking out the one of those big bus windows, the front window going up. <laughs> you don't remember that? I, I didn't. I don't remember that one at all. That was brutal. Yeah, I don't remember. Damn. But anyway, Chris Campbell, great road manager. He's out there talking. Yeah, yeah, Chris. Amazing. Well, yeah. well, dudes, I you know we could keep doing this all day. I think, but um, you know, is it? Uh, does anybody else have anything they want to share, or shall we end it? There was a there was a comment here that said, uh, you know, did Chick leave? Uh, anything with us to share with other musicians so yeah, um, you know, you, maybe we could all maybe we could all say that to uh to to close our our show here unless you guys have anything else you want to add great idea yeah. well no. i'll start um you know it's the, i i don't think you know the you know, the thing at the beginning of the video or at the beginning of our of our of our stream today pretty much said it all. You know, Chick was, um, you know, he was so much about, uh, you know, the arts and performing and just getting, allowing people to be free to create was the thing that he always said to me. Um, and, uh, and I think he, he wanted to, you know, impart that on, on all musicians to, uh, to not have any oppression, to be able to, to have that freedom, uh, to create. And, you know, uh, I think that was, from my angle, the most Im important thing he would always talk about because the practicing and uh, studying and the listening, I think all goes without saying. But, um, but uh, yeah, just the freedom to create thing and, uh, and do it, you know, 
to it, put it out there in a positive way and, and do it. So uh, for me personally, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming in today and hanging out. And, um, you know, it was really, really a fun time with the guys here, man. It was like a family, like I said, family reunion, fun time. And uh, push it over to one of you guys to uh, say, say a little something on that on that topic. I don't know if Chick ever shared with you about that, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I just remember, um, you know, the, the day last month we, we found out that he had passed and, and it was, we were all just in such shock. And I was just, I sat here on my floor and I, I you know, cried all day long, you know, and I, I, I talked to various friends and as we all know, all of them, not just the four of us, but just so many thousands of, of um, you know, Chick Corea lovers. And, and um, just remembering uh, like Frank said, you know how sad it is that that we won't be able to play live a- again. But but just such incredible gratitude for what we got to learn about what it was like to play music, and not 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 to say like to be able to play it on such a high level, which it was, but you know what it really means to make music with with other people. You know, one thing we've learned during this pandemic is how you know how getting to make music is such a, a, a soulful, deep love experience and how much we all miss being able to do that live. And, and with, you know, and Chick just taught me, you know, how, how great that is and what a, what a special, you know, you know, spiritual, spiritual experience that is. And so, you know, no matter, what we're what we're doing musically or artistically but just to you know persevere and continue to create with each other and and just like like um you know like the the uh thing that steve put together um at the beginning you know what what uh chick said about just you know if you encounter somebody who's who's uh you know just seems like they're in a bad way just playing some music, man. I mean, it's in your soul and, and to be able to create music and to be able to create music together and with friends, oh my gosh, it's just nothing, nothing better. Um, and that, you know, like, a, like every family, you know, the four of us are a family with, you know, Gail and, and Chick's whole family, all of us, you know, Bernie and Chris and everybody. Um, and uh, with this live record that's going to be coming out, you know, I'm sure we're going to do another one of these and, you know, talk about the record and just any excuse we can we can have to get together and and you know hang and whatever so hope people check out the record just because it's you know it's it's a, a cool um you know a, a cool shout out to chick and the band but uh an excuse for us all to be uh all of us the four of us and everybody you know watching for us uh, to honor chick yeah <clears throat> beautiful i feel like um the thing that always strikes me is how generous he was. Um, he went out of his way to uh, not only teach us, um, he was always encouraging. Um, he was always providing new opportunities. Uh, you know, for me personally, I would have never had a record deal. I would have never had a band. He encouraged me. He was always about all of us flourishing and being able to pursue many different things, but his, his, his sort of um, ideal thing was that everybody could come back and be together in the band, go out and do their own things, flourish, grow as artists and grow in their family life or whatever, and do, do whatever it was that they um, was in their heart's desire, but then come back and share and be a part of the band together. And that, that was like, you know, he, he changed a lot of stuff. Uh, he changed our lives in that regard. I think he, he facilitated and encouraged and believed in us. We were all very young. You know, he saw something in ourselves that we didn't even see, in my opinion. And, uh, and then inspired us and actually pushed us to become that better version of what we'd like to be. You know, so I feel like because he was that generous, it, it really impressed upon us the desire to share with other people and encourage other people too. And um, I think he, he taught us all what being a band leader is about, you know, also Absolutely. In, in the midst of all the 8 million other things he taught us. So, Yeah. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Look, you know, uh, for me, when, when Chick would call, I always said yes. I didn't even have to think about it. I just said, whatever it is, I'm there 100 uh, percent. I loved him that much, you know, for, forever. And his music always just was so powerful to me uh, that it was an, a real honor a true, genuine honor to be part of the, this incredible band of all you great, incredible talents and to be led by the great master who was Chick, you know. I would always say yes, no matter I didn't even care. I would drop other projects. <laughs> I would just go, yes, I'll be there. Um, and it, he left an incredible legacy for us to be inspired. He always inspired me. I was in awe of his compositional skills and his playing skills. It was just, and he was such a lovely man. To back it all up, an incredible human being, one that we can all look up to and, and be inspired by. And with his passing, for me, I feel uh, something's changed inside of me where I feel like, you know, I, I need to be more creative and be more productive and, and, and continue on, you know, holding that torch that he held so incredibly high, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, God bless him. I loved the man. It was an incredible honor to be part of his life and his legacy. Uh, and I, I feel very grateful and blessed to have been part of that. And, um, you know, I'm so sad he's gone. We had so many plans for the future. There were many electric band plans. And so, but I, I, I cherish every moment that we shared, all of us as a band and, you know, knowing the great man, Shakurya. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it was, I really didn't get to talk too much about that aspect of things. Um, but, um, you know, it's uh, when when we when we got the news of his passing, it hit us like it hit everybody else. We weren't prepared. We didn't know. Um, and, um, you know, it's uh, it, it took us. We have so much love for Chick that and obviously everything that we've ever done. Uh, and you know, like Frank, we all couldn't wait to hear from him, you know, and um, in fact, I, I, I became proactive. I had just married my, my wife, Clivia, in Italy, and I was driving through the mountains of Tuscany and listening to the electric band with her, and I was like, my God, this band was so killer. And we hadn't done anything for a while at that point. And I said, you know what, I'm going to write an email to everybody and just, you know, just say, wow, guys, this is so great. What are we, Chick, when are we going to do this again, you know? And it was kind of the, I'd, I'd, I'd love to, to think that it was partly responsible for us getting, you know, getting, getting it back together again, you know, in the, in the later years. And he was so inspired to do that. And, um, you know, it was, you know, coming back together was, a, was like sitting in an old rocking chair. And it was family. It was a family reunion. You know, we, we, we all have so much love for one another playing and for, and just, again, Chick was, um, you know, a father figure in a lot of senses, you know, he was, um, you know, we, he, he kind of looked at it. He wanted us to it would be our friends. And, you know, we were like, okay, dad, <laughs> you know, he was kind of like the, our mentor, you know, and, um, yeah, so we, uh, you know, he always would say, you know, um, you know, we're we're here for a short period, but we continue, and he would want us to continue. So that's I know, all of us will 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 do that, and hopefully we can do some things together as a as a unit. Um, you know, we wouldn't call it the electric band, but um, but we know that we would like to do you know play together and certainly play. Just keep playing, keep you know the spirit alive for what he was such a big part of for, for myself and for all of us and of, you know, just music and the love of music and how that helped everything in life. So in one sense, like Frankie says, it's, uh, there's a big hole, you know, um, but, uh, but I think we, we all, uh, we all feel to, uh, we owe it to him and to the music world to keep going keep pushing and, and support 
in that sense, you know, what Chick stood for. So yeah. long live uh, all of his, his music was so, had such impact and still does and always will. So uh, mm -hmm. I know, I know we'll be playing his songs in our bands for a long time to come, you know. Sure. And uh, please keep an eye out for the new record. When it comes out, uh, we'll, we'll all be talking about it. It will be on Chick's website. It'll be on our, all of our websites. We'll be doing, you know, a lot of promotion to put it out there so you all can hear it. And, and thank you for coming in and hanging with us today. Support means a lot. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right. Love all you guys. Take care. Yeah, okay, be guys. safe, be healthy, and make good music. Definitely. All right.